All right, so it is 7.32 p.m. on Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022. Uh, this is good evening. My name is Christian Klein. I'm the chair of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. And I'm calling this meeting of the board to order. Uh, first, I'd like to confirm all members and anticipated officials are present. Uh, so members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Roger DuPont. Here. Patrick Hanlon. Here. Kevin Mills. Here. Dan Riccardelli. Here. Elaine Hoffman. Here. And Venkat Holy. Here. Well, welcome to all of you. On behalf of the town, uh, Rick Valarelli, our board's administrator. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening. And joining him is Vincent Lee, who may be stepping out because I know he has a second meeting he's working on as well this evening. So. Correct. Perfect. Uh, and then appearing on behalf of our various cases, um, for uh, 1113 Lowell Street and 83 Palmer Street. Uh, Bob Anessi? Yes, I'm here. Good to see you. Uh, appearing on behalf of 25 Highland Avenue, Olaba Olaban. I'm also here. Good to, good to see you. Uh, appearing for 108 Pleasant Street, uh, Carl Coiner. I thought I saw, seen him earlier. We'll come back to him. Um, for 46 River Street, uh, Dennis and Marina Lasco. I'm here. Um, I believe my architect, Wiley Brown, is waiting to be let in. Ah, okay. Um, there's nobody in the waiting list at the moment, but if he does arrive, we will let him in. Um, and then for 44 Edmund Road, um, James Cypher, but I don't know if he's appearing this evening because they have requested a uh, continuance by letter. So um, I don't think he'll be making an appearance. <clears throat> okay, so this open meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals is being conducted remotely consistent with an act extending certain COVID-19 measures signed into law on February 15th, 2022. This act includes an extension until July 15th of 2022 of the remote meeting provisions of Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 executive order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law which suspended the requirement to hold all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed to continue to participate remotely. Public bodies may continue to meet remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. An opportunity for public participation will be provided during the public comment period during each public hearing. For this meeting, the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals has convened a video conference via Zoom map with online and telephone access as listed on the agenda posted to the town's website, identifying how the public may join. This meeting is being recorded and it will be broadcast by ACMI. Please be aware that attendees are participating by a variety of means. Some attendees are participating by video conference, others are participating by computer audio or by phone. Accordingly, please be aware that other folks may be able to see you, your screen name or another identifier please take care to not share personal information. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. We ask you to please maintain decorum during the meeting, including displaying an appropriate background. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the town's website unless otherwise noted. And the public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. And as chair, I reserve the right to take items out of order in the interest of promoting an orderly meeting. As the board will be taking up new business at this meeting as chair, I make the following land acknowledgement. <clears throat> Whereas the Zoning Board of Appeals for the Town of Arlington, Massachusetts, discusses and arbitrates the use of land in Arlington, formerly known as monotomy, an Algonquin word meaning swift waters, the board hereby acknowledges the Town of Arlington is located on the ancestral lands of the Massachusetts tribe, the tribe of indigenous peoples from whom the colony, province, and commonwealth have taken their names. We pay our respects to the ancestral bloodline of the Massachusetts tribe and their descendants who still inhabit historic Massachusetts territories today. This evening, I am very pleased to announce the select board voted on March 7th to approve another well-credentialed member of our town to fill the open associate position on our board. I'd like to introduce her to the board and ask her to briefly introduce herself, uh, Elaine Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am a local architect with about a decade of experience in and around New England. And I am a passive house certified professional as well as a lead accredited professional, um, and my expertise is in sustainable design, particularly related to operational energy and embodied carbon of new and existing structures. 
And I'm just excited to be joining the board uh, to help understand and assess the environmental implications um, of the topics before the board as relate to the zoning bylaws. So thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Welcome. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I was wondering Hanlon. if you could, uh, as we're getting into the meeting further, if you could uh, authorize me to record, it will make doing opinions easier later on. Absolutely. Mr. Hamlin, uh, you should be um, okay to record. I think, I think it's a, <clears throat> I think I'm fine, thanks. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to, to sort of swap the order of things on our agenda this evening um, in order to try to make things run a little smoother here. Um, I'm gonna jump right ahead to the hearings. Um, so, uh, so turning to the public hearings on tonight's agenda, some ground rules for clearing conduct of tonight's business. After I announce each agenda item, I'll ask the applicant to introduce themselves for themselves, make their presentation to the board, then request the members of the board ask what questions they have on the proposal. And after the board's questions have been answered, I will open the meeting for public comment. And at the conclusion of public comment, the board will deliberate and vote on all matters. Uh, so the first is <clears throat> what appears on the agenda is item number six, docket 3687, 1113 Lowell Street. Um, for the applicant is uh, Bob Inessi. Yes, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, hearing me this evening. Uh, I'm given to understand that the board has heard from the uh, building commissioner, uh, Michael Champa, with respect to uh, the fact that uh, uh, Mr. Champa has located within the bowels of town hall, uh, a, an old decision from 1961 uh, that I kept referring to uh, on the building card that uh, I uh, had introduced uh, on a couple of hearings indicating that there was a zoning decision uh, reflecting the fact that the uh, zoning board in 1961 had agreed uh, that the uh, property had been converted from a three to a four family structure. Uh, unfortunately, this matter has gone on for a year and a half uh, without that decision having surfaced. Uh, and uh, quite frankly, it came down to the ninth inning for my client uh, because he was getting fire sale offers to purchase the property uh, from uh, folks who wanted to buy it from him saying, you're never going to get a four, all you're going to get is a two, so sell it to us for whatever. Uh, fortunately, he did not do that. So I'm, I'm happy that uh, Mr. Champo was able to find that decision. He's indicated that he is prepared to issue the permit if he's not done so already. I'd like to make a comment uh, too about the, the building department, uh, particularly why the building inspector had to go to the bowels of town hall to find this decision. Why isn't there enough money in the town budget so that we can have someone on staff in the building department who can fulfill that role so that we don't have an important individual like the acting building commissioner having to go to the basement of town hall to try to find old decisions like this that never should have happened. And I'm wondering if the collective zoning board of appeal in its wisdom could uh, maybe make application to the town in some manner, whether it's the board of selectmen or some other body for uh, some sort of a budgetary allocation uh, so that someone can be appointed uh, to the building department uh, for the purpose of doing this kind of ministerial work that frees up the building inspector to do what the building inspector or commissioner uh, should really be doing. And uh, again, I think it's a waste of town resources. I grew up in this town. Uh, I've owned property in this town all of my life. I like to see my tax dollars uh, go in a, uh, be used in a productive way. 
and having the building inspector go to the basement of town hall to look for old decisions is not having my tax dollars used in a productive way. One more comment. Uh, I'm hoping that the board, when it has its meeting in a couple of weeks, will talk about the fact that uh, late filings to the board uh, should not be allowed to come in where the applicant doesn't have an opportunity of responding. Uh, when you have something come in uh, to the board hours before a zoning hearing uh, and uh, the applicant uh, really doesn't have an opportunity to respond. That happened to me twice in 11 to 13 Lowell Street. And the first time I simply let it go by, the second time I couldn't let it go by because my back was against the wall. Uh, the other issue here is that had this matter gone forward, had the zoning board turned it down, had it gone to court, had it been turned down, and later on had the decision shown up, guess what? The, building, the town could not be sued. The building commissioner could not be sued. Town employees could not be sued. But Bob and Essie, as counsel for the applicant, probably could be sued if the argument could be made that he didn't act in a due diligent way to try to ascertain where that old decision was. So my point is, I would like to see remedial steps made. Uh, I understand there are, there are difficulties in the building department at this point. I understand there are budgetary issues that have to be looked at as well, but you've got to free the building commissioner up so he can do his yeah. job and he's not doing ministerial functions. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Um, I do know that the building department has been trying to hire um, an additional inspector for a period of time and has not been uh, not had much success in terms of, of filling that position. And I, <clears throat> I would ask uh, Mr. Valorelli if he knows if that position has been filled yet. I my sense is it probably hasn't. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. So we have a candidate and um, we are still short staffed to uh, secretarial positions that we are now interviewing. Or okay. uh, the town is interviewing. So uh, we're getting there, but uh, Mr. Inessi is absolutely right. We've been short staffed for many, many months at this point. So with, with all this in mind, um, so in regards to 1113, Lowell Street, the request was uh, a determination by the board that the building could have four units. Um, and as Mr. Nessie noted, the 1961 decision was located that does indicate that the building is currently um, allowed to have four units. And so with that, um, <clears throat> there is, and the building inspector has acknowledged that and has agreed to issue the permit. So I believe at this point that all that's left is for the board to, um, to dismiss the complaint because it's, no longer uh, required. Does, does that meet your needs, Mr. Nessie? That's, I would agree with that. I can withdraw it as well, either way. Okay. Um, if you don't mind with, um, I think withdrawal is probably the, the proper way to go. Um, do note we have a couple people who would like to speak to this issue. Um, so before I call on them, I just want to ask on the board, are there any members of the board who have a question in regards to this matter with Lowell Street? Seeing none, um, I'll now open the meeting for public comment. Public questions and comments will only be taken as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed to the board for the purpose of informing a decision. Members of the public will be granted time to ask questions and make comments. The chair asks those wishing to address the board a second time during any particular hearing to please be patient and allow those wishing to speak for the first time to go ahead. Members of the public who wish to speak should digitally raise their hand using the button on the participant tab in the Zoom application. Those calling in by phone, please dial star nine to indicate you would like to speak. You'll be called upon by the meeting host to be asked to give your name and address for the record and you'll be given time for your questions and comments. All questions will be addressed through the chair. Please remember to speak clearly. And once all public questions and comments have been addressed or the allocated time has ended, the public comment period will be closed. Um, so with that, uh, the first person wishing to speak is Mr. Moore. 
Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, I, I noticed that uh, the building inspector is not on this call. Um, perhaps Mr. Valerelli is familiar with the searching that Mr. Ciampa had to do. Is that correct, Mr. Chair? Um, Mr. Valerelli, are you aware of the circumstances of the search? It, it is, Mr. Uh, Moore and uh, Mr. Chairman. So the um, uh, the area of the town hall that has all the records is, for lack of a better term, a mess. Right, so, right. Uh, Mr. Valerelli, you don't have to give me those details. I, <laughs> I was asking if, in the absence of Mr. Champa, Mr. Valerelli could answer questions that I might have. So just to save the board's time, I, I, I apologize I, for interrupting. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt, Mr. Moore. I cannot. All I saw was the uh, decision that was found. I know none okay. of the background of this at all. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, th thank you, Mr. Valerelli. No, I, I appreciate your, your being familiar. When, when Mr. Anessi mentioned that the decision was found in the bowels of town hall, I wanted to find out if he was uh, uh, being uh, facetious or, or was that literally true? And it sounds like from what you're saying, it was literally true found in the basement of the town hall where I have been. I'm familiar with, with what it is. And since that is the case, I want to uh, megaphone what Mr. Anessi had to say. It's, it's, it's shocking and embarrassing and unprofessional for what I've found to be down in the basement of the town hall. And if that's true, that valid records are down there because it was hard to tell whether or not they were valid or just forgotten or extra or temporary or whatever. If there are valid records down there, this situation must be remediated. It's critical, particularly in this case, as Mr. Nessie clearly points out, that there could have been litigation that came out of a mistake made because of the quality of those records and their storage. I think I would like to, uh, as I said, foot stomp what he had to say in that the town budget needs, money needs to be found. I don't really care where, and I don't really care whose department, you know, this is a permanent building. So maybe it comes out of that fund. This must be, it must be lit, cleaned up and figured out. And the fact that the building inspector had to go do that because he was short staffed, I understand that, that may have been because of COVID and a number of people going, but even administrative or secretary people should not have had to go down there and do that. It's right now is dangerous and I want to foot stomp that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, I have this feeling that we're being told this because we happen to be here. Um, and, but it certainly is not within our purview to uh, determine the budget either of inspectional services or anyone else. And I think for those people who feel strongly about this, including most, uh, including Mr. Anessi and Mr. Moore, uh, that they would be find themselves more effectively making th their comments, their feelings known to Mr. Pooler and to the finance committee who ultimately are the ones who have to make these kinds of decisions and and we have other than that that this is all on ACMI, we have no real role uh, in being able to do that. Mr. Chairman, yes, sir. Um, Mr. Hanlon has an excellent point. I didn't mean to make it so strongly as I was sounding to this particular board, but because he's right, it's not your guys' uh, responsibility, and and it's a very it's it's very well taken. I just want to when. If, if the chairman or the board members have a chance to bring this issue forward, I would appreciate their, their support. I also will ask that question. Good point, Mr. Hanlon, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next on our list is uh, Mr. Loretti. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Can you hear me? I can, sir. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to just start with a question. I'm looking at the list of reference materials for this hearing. I'm not seeing one that's clearly the decision to which Mr. Anessi referred. Has that been posted? That is a very good question.
Mr. Valarelli, do you recall if that was posted? I do not know, Mr. Chairman. I know that the uh, building commissioner has sent that personally to the uh, chair and to the members, I believe. Okay. Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, I don't want to waste a lot of time. I don't think it has been. And so I must share um, Mr. Nessie's frustration about not having access to the relevant documents in a timely manner. Um, but I would like to suggest that it's not merely a problem for the town. The concerning bylaw requires decisions to be filed. Do you have deeds? I think not. And I will ask Mr. Anessi to ensure that it has been and that all future decisions of his clients are popular. because too often are not, are not filed. Now, um, since I can't comment intelligently on the substance of whether this should be treated as a two-family or a four-family home, not having seen that decision, I would just like to raise one other point. Um, if indeed it is a legal four-family, I hope the board can agree that it is not a, a one or two-family home. And if it's not a one or two-family home, then the provisions of the zoning bylaw that apply to other types of structures apply. And uh, I haven't looked closely enough at the plans, but indeed, if the uh, applicant is seeking to increase the floor area, then they have to come back before your board. And Mr. Ciampa cannot simply grant a building permit. And I say that because if it's not a one or two family home, then that property is subject to a 0.35 or 35% uh, floor area ratio, which it already exceeds. And the zoning bylaw is explicit that that ratio cannot be increased for other than a one or two family home. It also has other dimensional non-conformities that will trigger review by your board, either for a special permit or for a variance. And so I don't want the board to just wash their hands of this and say, oh, great, Mr. Ciampa can just grant the building permit with no further review of our board. Because by my reading of the zoning bylaw, that is not the case at all. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's an issue uh, somewhat separate from whether it's a legal, well, it's, it's related to the issue of whether it's a legal two family or a legal four family. Uh, but clearly it can't, the applicant can't have it both ways. They cannot claim that this is a legal four-family home and then seek to have the zoning, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the, the zoning exceptions for one or two-family homes apply. It doesn't work that way. Um, so that, that, I'll leave it at that, um, Mr. Chair. But um, that, that's my take on this. And I, will ho I, I do hope that the, um, the board can see that that uh, decision is posted at some point. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next on our list is Mr. Seltzer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I kind of got sucked into this um, docket back in January when I was attending uh, ZBA for another hearing and was just sort of interested in it. And at the time I did in real time, I actually did some historical research and provided Mr. Inessi with some uh, photographs of the building, which suggested the four family use. But uh, I think it was from the 1980s and probably isn't relevant to what was happening back in um, 1961. So um, I have a couple of questions trying to understand how the bylaw treats non-conforming properties. Um, the first one has to do with that 1961 building permit. It was worded that it was to add a single room. And I'm wondering if that constitutes a conversion from a three family to four family, um, since obviously it's not adding a kitchen, which is necessary um, for an additional living unit or even a bathroom. And the next point is um, 8.1.7, which relates to the restoration, abandonment, or non-use of non-conforming uses. Um, I've sent the board um, 
a history of the occupancy. And the interesting thing is after these 1961 events, uh, the usage shows that it clearly for at least five years um, was not used as a four family. In fact, the 11 Lowell side, um, Lowell Street side was used just for one family. And it wasn't until 1967 that we see any evidence that it was actually being used as a four family. So I'm not sure how 8.1.7 applies to this. And the final question is, it appears that there's been a recent demolition of the rear annex of the existing building. Um, I didn't see a permit for that. And I'm just wondering, does that somehow constitute an abandonment of use as a four family? Um, I'm not sure I expect you all to be able to present answers to that this evening, but just some issues to be considered. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. Um, looking at the card, uh, let me see. Let me admit some people from the waiting list. Um, so this is the packet, the application package. Um, the current application package. So they are intending to, although the, the size of the building is increasing, uh, the lot coverage is being reduced. Um, and so that may be the re that rear portion of the building that is being removed. Um, as to the, the increase in the floor area ratio, um, <clears throat> that's something that, um, is up to the, the zoning administrator, um, the zoning official from the town, if uh, to note if that's an issue, and then to um, call for the appropriate review. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, um, I, if I'm not mistaken, and this case has gone on for a long time, and my memory gets shorter and shorter as my year, years get longer. Um, but I believe this is an appeal from a decision of the building inspector. And th the building inspector has indicated to us that he intends to withdraw that decision and make a different decision. Uh, at that point, there's really nothing before us anymore. Uh, we, there's no decision that we could really make. If we reverse the decision of the building inspector, we'd be doing the very same thing he did before. And since he's backed away from the decision that was being appealed, really, there's nothing before us. Um, there may very well be reasons why it is that uh, the people who are interested in, and are raising legal questions about this should be in touch with Mr. Ciampa. Uh, and it's conceivable that, uh, that other people beside the applicant could appeal a decision of the building inspector. Uh, but either way, none of this is right for us. We're, we don't have a special permit application. We don't have a variance application. There's nothing before us to appeal. And so, you know, there's, it is true that Mr. Uh, Mr. Inessi is just waiting here to withdraw his application. Uh, mm -hmm. And I don't see any reason or any ability that we have to uh, not to grant that uh, because there's nothing left for us to decide. I agree, Mr. Hanlon. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, very good, okay. Um, so at that point, then let's go ahead. I will stop the share on this. Where's my sharing window go? There it goes, okay. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and uh, close the public comment for this hearing, and we'll go ahead and accept the withdrawal um, from uh, the applicant. Mr. Moderator, can I add one thing? Mr. Loretti? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chris Loretti, 56 I, I would just like to follow up on something that um, Mr. Seltzer said. And again, I, I feel like a disadvantage not seeing being able to see the decision. But the question I have is this, if a decision um, was made to allow uh, four units in that building, 
but subsequently those units were removed so that it became a legal two family, then doesn't the two family limitation apply? And doesn't the application applicant have to show that the four units were continuously used since the time um, that special permit was issued? I really don't think that the documentation that has been shared on the on the town website does that. Um, and I would just say to, to Mr. Um, Hanlon's point that indeed, if, if the only decision before the board is whether this is a, a legal two family or a legal four family, then, then I understand his point and it goes back to uh, Mr. Chiampa, but that, that does not necessarily mean that he's free to simply issue the building permit giving the dimensional um, considerations that may suggest that this has to go back to your board in any case. Thank you. Still ready. Um, so with that, um, I'm going to go ahead and formally close the public hearing um, and we'll move on. Uh, so at this point, um, Mr. Inessi, we will go ahead and um, accept your withdrawal of 1113 Lowell Street. Which will return back to the building inspector and then it's up to the building inspector to um, proceed with the review of the application in light of the decision from 1961. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I wonder if we need to have a, a motion and, uh, and a vote to formally accept the withdrawal. We can certainly do so. I move that we, <laughs> this should be quick. I, I move that we accept Mr. Uh, Anessi's withdrawal of the uh, appeal. Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Uh, vote of the board, uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Um, and Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Uh, Ms. Hoffman had to jump off the call this evening. Uh, she was able to join us just at the start, but she has uh, prior business travel uh, this evening. So she's- Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I just, just to make sure the record is clear and that everybody who is here and has uh, shared their opinions with us uh, uh, is clear on this. Our, our acceptance of the withdrawal of the application doesn't express any opinion whatever on the merits of any of the issues that have been raised either tonight or previously. Uh, there's a process that's going to start again as to uh, uh, whether to grant this building permit and what all the legal ramifications are. Mr. Champa is the one who is responsible for making those decisions in the first instance. And uh, if we do see it again, we'll take it under advisement in the way it's in the way it's presented to us then. Thank you. Um... That I will on the agenda. I will move to. I'm going to pull the next item. Uh, it's actually, docket number item number eleven, which is docket three six five eight, eighty three Palmer Street. I'm bringing this forward because uh, this is also a case being brought forward um, by Mr. Anessi. Yes, uh, the I had originally asked to have this matter continued. I am not the attorney who is handling. Uh, the uh, application for a building permit that's going to be filed under the energy bylaw, it's a different attorney. Uh, the, I had originally asked to have it continued. Upon reflection, uh, I think my request for a continuance would be uh, for a, a longer period of time than would be reasonable. Uh, consequently, uh, I've changed my mind and I'm requesting uh, that the uh, matter be withdrawn without prejudice. Now I am keeping my options open. I will, uh, Mr. Klein ind indicated that at one point, I am keeping my options open. Uh, that is if for any reason, uh, the other attorney who files under the energy bylaw uh, uh, is not successful with that, I would like to come back and go forward before the board with the matter that I have uh, filed, the application I have filed. So I would like to have it withdrawn without prejudice. And I'm requesting that of the board at this time. 
Thank you, Mr. Nessie. Are there any questions from the board in regards to this matter? None. Are there any questions or comments from the general public on this matter? I'll open the public comment period. None. I'll go ahead and close the public comment period. Um, <clears throat> so with that, may I have a motion uh, to withdraw the special permit application for 83 Palmer Street without prejudice? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. And vote of the board. Uh, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. Holly? Aye. The chair votes aye. So that is withdrawn without prejudice. Thank you very much, Mr. Nassi. Thank you for your time. Good evening. Good evening. So with that, I'll move back up our list uh, to, <clears throat> excuse me, doc, uh, item number seven, docket number 3677, 25 Highland Avenue. Um, so this is a continuance from a prior hearing. Uh, the board had previously voted a uh, special permit in regards to certain aspects of this project. Uh, what's before us now is the, the second portion of this request, which was a variance um, in regards to uh, parking in the front yard setback. Uh, so with that, I will turn to Olga Bon. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Thank you again for giving me time uh, to speak on this matter. And. Uh, um, I want to start with the um, end of a last meeting we went, I went before the board in regards of 25 uh, Highland Avenue. Uh, we are doing a um, two family renovation and this time in, the, in this uh, variance we're asking for additional parking um, in front of the house. <clears throat> and uh, the board asked me to provide structural plan for parking, address the visibility issue, um, address the fact how the dirt will be removed and um, also get a geotechnical research on the um, soil in front of the property. So um, uh, the file is attached to, would you like me to share this or you can share that and I can just uh, walk through the each document. So the first one I have here is the plot plan. Yes, yeah, so the plot plan has been updated <clears throat> and you can scroll up. So you can see on the front of the house, um, this is the um, proposed um, slab for the parking, which is 20 by 18. Um, as discussed previously, we're planning for two cars and a little bit extra space in front for future um, occupants to have maybe um, trash cans, a um, few things of that nature, not more than, not more than that. Because currently there is no space, uh, the trash cans have to be dragged all the way up and down uh, for trash removal. So for that, we're planning to have a little bit space in front for the trash cans and two cars parked. Uh, there is a tree, as you can see on the uh, right side on the bottom, uh, which is on the sidewalk. The requirements, we have to be four feet from the tree and we exactly fitting in the parking slab between the tree and the um, current um, walkway up, which will be also replaced and reinforced. It's just in a really bad condition at this point. Does it, uh, so can you scroll up? I can uh, have other documents attached there. Sure, they, they came through as individual ones. So I'm gonna go ahead. Oh, okay. Because um, if, if I share the screen, I can just scroll through them. Okay, so this is a geotechnical engineering report. Um, as you can see, uh, it's a, it's a pretty short uh, report. We had a geotech on site. We called the dig safe and they came in on site to um, do the site tour um, to check in the front um, of the property of, that we're intending to build 20 by 18 parking slab on the grade. So they have done the test pits within the area and determined uh, that there is um, a test pit reveal that there is a, a boulder ledge uh, two feet down, which a um, couple other tests on the same area also relieved that. So um, our plan at this point is to um, retain geotechnical engineering service, uh, this particular company, to work with us on site uh, when we will start if approved 
uh, doing this work. So they will be monitoring. Um, if, if the ledge is too excessive and we don't have a way to remove it, we will definitely have to stop. But according to this um, report and we spoke with them on site, that should not be a problem. That's something what they do every day, really. That's the service they provide. So is the, is the thought that they would be able to excavate the material without yeah. the need for chipping? Yeah. Okay. This is the dig safe notice. Yeah, that's the uh, dig safe was called in. Um, is the structural drawings. Yep, so this is a uh, structural plan for um, the slab. Um, particular, this is the wall, retaining wall, uh, done by um, <clears throat> Design LLC, T Design LLC. And it has, I think, three documents should be all together with it. Perfect, thank you. Plan. So this is a um, retaining wall review, this footings and the um, vertical um, uh, section of the uh, back wall. Mm -hmm. And so the, the approximate height of the wall is eight feet, is that correct? Yes. And that will be the highest point. That's what it is uh, going up to the house. Okay. Last document. Um, oops, where, there you are. So I, um, based on the last meeting, I feel like the biggest concern for a lot of um, <clears throat> members of the board and the neighborhood was where the solution to address uh, the visibility concern. So I've done my research and I've put it into this document. Um, as option one, I'll be proposing to install an alley exit kit, which is um, used widely um, in on the garage exit, on alley exits. It warns pedestrians when a vehicle is exiting out of the small parking facility or uh, with a voice alert and flashing car coming um, next. So um, if you scroll down, you will see this is how it looks. So it has this three, um, how it operates. It has this trigger, triggering sensor detects a vehicle start exiting the parking spot and it sends the signal to pass controller located inside of the sign. sign. The pass controller will activate the system and the voice alert attention vehicle exiting watch for vehicles plus that a sign will flash it does have a light so it doesn't matter during the day or at night it will be flashing with the light so pass controller will continue continue to activate the sign for 10 seconds it is adjustable it can go for longer or um, if a second vehicle activates the system and resets another second timer again it can go for longer it can be adjusted so um, if um, the residents feel like the sound can disturb them, that also audio can be cut off and the flashing only can be used. So that's one of the option. Option two um, are the adjustable mirrors that can be placed across. Um, those are used again also a lot um, for backing up it's um, ideal for private and business usage. In this, in this particular case, that will be private usage for this property. It gives more safety, um, increases, doesn't matter if you indoor or outdoor, they will work just fine. Um, again, the description of the mirror right there. So first option, second option can be used on as their selves um, on, um, or together. If you scroll down, you'll see both options can be hanged different ways. Up or down can be adjusted for better vis visibility as an extra solution again. So um, I put together a little bit more of information, additional information on uh, backup cameras. As we all know, um, most of the cars, all of the cars at this point um, have backup cameras. It, it was a federal requirement since um, 2018 but even before that, a lot of cars been uh, equipped with backup cameras. So um, that mandate just increased the amount and most of the cars that are manufactured from 2018 do have that. Also, um, besides backup cameras, there is a multiple different safety features in the cars right now. Um, the um, parking, uh, rear parking sensors 
that will sound an alarm or um, in, when the vehicles um, in, coming by in the back or even if uh, somebody walking. Um, in addition to the backup cameras on many vehicles today supplemented also Red Cross traffic alert also senses traffic approaching from either side uh, when in the reverse and um, cross traffic alert sound and alarm, but also growing number of vehicles equipped with automatic rear braking. Um, so car will just stop on its own if uh, it um, detects vehicle or uh, pedestrian approaching. So, real, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. Right so this is uh, four points that I had to address and I've tried to do my best uh, putting it all in documents. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, there was a dirt removal question. Dirt will be removed off-site. Uh, there is not really space in the property to place that, so that has to be taken out. Thank you very much for that. Um, so this is a request for variance. Um, so as we discussed on, on prior requests for variances, variances have a different set of criteria than a standard special permit um, and has a, a higher threshold for, um, for approval because a variance is essentially requesting to do something that is against local zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and in this case, uh, I have the application here um, in front of us. Uh, the request is for a front, uh, two parking spaces in the front yard. Um, which in this case would be require uh, cutting into the hillside in order to create the parking spaces. Currently this house and, excuse me, the adjacent properties, um, particularly heading up Highland Avenue, do not have parking because of uh, a considerable grade change um, on the edge of the sidewalk. Um, and visiting the site this past weekend, um, looking at the site relative to the, the application and the the provided site plan, it appears that the height of the existing retaining wall um, at the edge of the sidewalk in the location where the discussion is to, um, to put the parking spaces is about five foot four. Wow. The, the cut would be five foot four, the sidewalk, and then would be increasing, um, as Ms. Ben said, to eight feet at the back wall. Uh, so that is the that's the size of the retaining that that needs to be put in place um, within the front yard setback in order to um, to accommodate those spaces at the level of the sidewalk. And then obviously they'll also require a curb cut, which is a, a separate application from the engineering yeah. division. So there are four criteria that are required for a special permit, uh, excuse me, for a variance. Um, which is enumerated here at the top. Um, so there has to be something related to the soil condition, shape, topography of the land or structure, which especially affects such land or structure, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located, um, that a literal enforcement of the zoning bylaw would involve substantial hardship and desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the ordinance or bylaw. And those requirements are, oops. Oh, sorry about that. I think I, um, am I still on the call? Yes, you are. Yes. Oh, good, okay. I lost my, I lost my video there. Yes. Uh, so uh, these, these are established under state guide, state law. So they are not, um, something that the, the board has a lot of discretion over. Um, so if this, let me go ahead. I would like to just uh, zoom in a little bit on this. Um, So typically a house in Arlington, you would have parking either under the house or in the side yard or in the rear yard. Um, in this case. There is none, uh, just because of um, the way it sits on the hill. Mm -hmm. And so the request is to 
provide for parking in the front yard. Yeah, at least, well, there is no more space at, at, for two cars. So each um, occupant for each unit has a space. Okay. And currently, I believe they do have parking on the street. Is that correct? To my knowledge, yes. Yeah. All this property is uh, neighbor to the uh, left and neighbor to the right um, who does not have a parking in front. Mm -hmm. um, to my knowledge, they, we all park on, this, on the street. Are there questions from the board in regards to? We, uh, I, as I remember, and members of the board do remember, we had extensive conversation on um, all the points, and um, we we all had a, a time to to talk about and discuss that. Um, what really um, stand stands out, and I, what I'm asking for, as um, the owner of the property. My goal is to uh, to have to build renovate this property for the new occupants and have just comfortable living. Um, I do understand there is available parking on the street. However, um, it's all in it's all possible with the right approach of the building and structural engineers to build that retaining wall and do and to have two parking in front of the property. It's all possible. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is a not and it, it is a not large development as uh, I'm sure you do a lot of work through um, in those meetings. Uh, my husband and I, we are um, just a smaller company, and this is not a first project in Arlington. Um, we do pride ourselves on the quality work and uh, what we deliver to the to the towns that we work in. Um, and that's why I do these meetings myself. Yeah. I uh, my goal is to have a comfortable, nice property for the new occupants. And in this case, we do see opportunity in front of the property to have this parking, to have just comfortable, convenient um, for the owners. Mm -hmm. And that will um, add value, in my opinion. So from the, from the board's perspective, the, the fact that you can build it doesn't necessarily mean that we are allowed to allow it to be built under state law. So we need to go look at the, we do need to evaluate the criteria. So we, we do appreciate your uh, providing the additional materials um, that are very helpful to our discussion. Um, Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. Yeah, so could we uh, review sort of what the dimensional aspects of this are? Because, you know, we've got the street, we've got the sidewalk, we've got the existing retaining wall. And could we sort of go through what the dimensions are going to be like at the end of the retaining wall? Um, where, where is the end of the retain, the end of the proposed parking, front yard parking is, so that, that's right on essentially the sidewalk. And so at the corners where you have the retaining wall, mm -hmm. what are, um, what are the heights right at those corners? I know, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned that they started a certain- height and then they move backward and they increase as you get toward the house yes. so could All we right. could we talk a little bit about what that is and how does that conform to our bylaw i know we have some some uh provisions in the bylaw as far as vis visibility goes visibility. in terms of <clears throat> in yep. terms of uh, what the heights are supposed to be as you're coming out onto the street. I'm not sure that those strictly apply at the sidewalk, but could we go through again those dimensions, please? Certainly. So at present, the so this is the retaining wall that's there currently, and currently it has a break uh, mm -hmm. for the walkway, the steps up. Um, so at this point here at the edge of the steps, and then at a point here, approximately four feet from the center line of the tree, um, the top of that wall is is mostly parallel going, following the sidewalk. It, it's, um, it's around five foot four, somewhere between five four and five six. And will that, will that height be maintained under this proposal? So the goal is not to touch the grading on the right. However, if we have to, um, 
just for visibility issue to regrade, uh, say, three feet in and I'm, remove remove the grade that's to to increase the visibility um that's possible however uh right now the proposal is only work uh, solely in the slab um proposed 20 by 18 so we started with 54 and the highest um number on the back will be 8 feet so just to be clear so it is still going to be roughly 5 foot 4 at the retaining wall as the uh, driveway meets the sidewalk. Correct. Well, the goal is not to touch the grade um, anymore, only work in that 20 by 18. However, um, where, this, where the uh, stairs going up, um, walkway to the property, there will be um, much better visibility, obviously, just because uh, the grading is done um, from previous with having the walkway going up. So that that allows for greater visibility. The right side will have a higher 5.4. Now, again, um, if say we need, I, I made a um, note last time. I think somebody did mention um, there was a requirement um, on the lowest. Um, if we have to come down to four feet to just um, regrade that, Hill, so to speak, to increase the visibility that that we can do because the dirt will be coming upside no matter what. So Mr. Dubai, I would go ahead and um, ask Mr. Valarelli if he can confirm what the current town bylaw requirement is for visibility at the corners. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. So from the front lot line, the um, any retaining wall or fence or whatever uh, cannot exceed. 30 inches in height for the first five feet going inward toward the property. So not exceed 30 inches and extending five feet in? That's correct. So the first five feet uh, can only be 30 inches um, high. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So as I understand it, then the request or the, the variance would be not only for the parking in the front yard, but it would also have to be for the uh, for the requirement of that 30 inches for a length of five feet, a distance of five feet? That would be correct. Okay. So in, in this case, the right side will have to be regraded. Um, that retaining wall in front of the property has to be redone um, anyway, actually. Um, it's just not in a good... Um, shape right now. Okay. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Um, Mr. Holly. For the pad is going to be around 360 square feet over the 350 limit for the paved surface. Is that something that's triggering impervious surface? Yes. So would the, is the proposed, so the proposed, this is a concrete slab, is that correct? Right, that's what we're proposing. Um, but I do also understand the concern. Um, if we have to put a pavers pervious or pervious, um, there is a different options right now on the market for pervious um, driveway solutions mm -hmm. um, that will allow the uh, water to run off. That can be done as well to minimize the. Uh, right, because in town, if you increase by more than 350 square feet, you have to go through engineering for a stormwater. Right. right. So currently on this property, on this lot, uh, there will be no um, no concrete, no, no slabs. It's all mostly um, just wood sunken patio we have on the first floor proposed. Um, and it's going to be all grass. That's the plan. There is no pavers anywhere in the back. It's all grass. Right, but the slab here is greater than 350. Right, right, right. So, right. so yeah, in, in this case, we'll have to get a previous um, uh, solution for the uh, for this for the parking. Either the uh, previous pavers or um, there's a eco-friendly type of um, uh, driveways available on the market too of. Um, research those as well.
and we're back. There we go. Um, are there other questions from the board? Just, just, just an observation that um, it's just an eight foot structural wall. It needs um, drain or weeps. Otherwise, it's going to over a period of time. To tell. Just a side note, I think. Um, I don't see one from the structural wrong. Okay. Thank you. Actually, um, I I did observe that too. I, I meant to ask that question. Um, my partner uh, was working with the structural engineering on getting that done. In the past, we built the walls of that height and um, there is a drainage um, accounted right. for. We've done that. In the structural section, that it is there mm -hmm. is a, an indicated four inch seepage drain at 48 inches. So that would hopefully be there. Um, any further questions from that board? Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, so I, j just one question. I, I think um, just looking back at the variance um, requirements, and I know one of them is that um, you know variance requests don't um, create detriments to the, the public. And I'm just wondering, I know that um, when we previously reviewed this, there were some groundwater issues. So just trying to, um, you know, I'm not, I, I can't comment on whether this would uh, impact that groundwater condition that we already reviewed. Um, but uh, based on Mr. Hawley's comment and, and yourself, um, just wondering how we could evaluate that to make sure it's not detrimental to any neighbors. Um, so besides, um, can I answer that question? Because we, we I spoke to the geotech um, company that was on site course for the uh, front parking. They also have uh, done analysis for us for the side right side of the property where we have a four foot wall. Because that question came up on uh, my special permit as well. And they have established that is with Rick already. I've sent in all the information to the building department. There is um, no groundwater issues uh, whatsoever. Even though um, we have put in that four foot wall on the um, property line, it also <clears throat> was proposed by a structural engineer, which we provided all the um, plans to, this, to the building already. Um, builder is putting a, a crushed stone along the wall on the side of 25 Highland Avenue. However, there was no signs of a water issues uh, notice at the point of the um, analysis. And there is no visibility, visible issues that that could be an issue at all. Thank you, Ms. Van. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Dupont. Um, I, I don't want to elevate form over substance. And I really do appreciate Ms. Bond's diligence in getting information to us over a period of time. When I look at the uh, application, and I don't actually have it in front of me, I just have notes. And, and I'd be curious to know what the rest of the members of the board feel. Um, I mean, it, it's really talking about a variance from the requirements as far as location of parking spaces go. And it, it's not really in relation to what we were just discussing, which is that requirement that walls or other construction uh, pieces are no higher than 30 inches. And, and so I don't see that as being part of the relief that's being requested. And that said, I know the board tends to try to help applicants to form their or formulate, you know, their their applications or petitions, and we we try to be flexible on that point. But I'm just not sure that that's actually before us. And I do have a concern about that particular part of things because I think it's a critical element. And so I know, you know, that there's a representation being made that there's not going to be a visibility issue, but I'm not sure that that there's any evidence of that in front of us. So I do have a particular concern that that's not actually part of what's before us uh, tonight. 
And okay. so I'm not sure exactly how to proceed on that. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, once we get finished asking our questions, is there going to be a continuation of the public hearing? There is, yes. Okay. In fact, that'll probably happen right now. Um, unless there's any further questions from the board, I would like to open this hearing up for public comment. Um, as Mr. Himmels? Yes. I'm, <clears throat> what will be the height of the wall at the back towards the house? Eight feet. Eight feet. <clears throat> Eight feet? Yes. That sounds dangerous. Hey, somebody fall on eight feet and you, know, you can break a leg. Right. Uh, falling from the top, you mean we can put a rail in? Um, yeah. I mean, it's going to be a front yard. People are going to be walking around. Oh, absolutely. Way. Absolutely. As a common yeah. space, uh, somebody can jump off of the, um, that will be, uh, that has to be secured. Yes. Thank you. I wouldn't okay. want my kids play on that front here. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and open this for public uh, comment. Uh, comments are taken as they relate to the matter, but can be directed to the chair. Um, if you can raise your hand using the, the raise hand feature um, under the reactions tab, or if you're dialing in, you can dial star nine. Uh, so first on our list is Mr. Moore. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Steve Moore, Piedmont Street. Um, uh, I am going to talk about the tree, the public tree that's there in a moment, but before I get to that, I'd like to um, mention that, I mean, I am, I am not a geotechnical engineer, I'm not a general contractor or a builder. However, I'm concerned about removing this much material this close to a foundation that's already existing, um, both from a perspective of ledge removal and um, and actually any instability that may be caused by removal of all that material. Yeah, I know there's gonna be a retaining wall built and such, but you've got to remove all that material first. Um, and I just, it just doesn't feel right instinctually. <laughs> instinctively. However, I'm not an expert. So I, I, I'm sure something like that probably can be done. The finished product when this is, when it's completed, however, uh, visually will be not only striking, but Kind of shocking, I believe, and looking around the other uh, area of the neighborhood in the vicinity of this property, there's nothing at all like that. And um, I'm not sure how much in keeping with the neighborhood, this sort of sunken into the wall parking that will be remaining will be. It doesn't strike me it will be in particular uh, keeping with, with the neighborhood. Um, speaking to the tree issue, um, I saw that the measurement is the tree is the tree trunk is four feet from the edge of where the driveway will be. To remove this much material and build that size of a retaining wall and pour a slab, much more material closer to than less than four feet from the tree trunk is going to have to be excavated and removed, even just to build a wall that ends up being four feet to the tree trunk. I'm concerned about the damage that is probably gonna to happen to this public street tree. Um, and uh, there has to be a tree hearing, I guess maybe not a tree hearing since they're within the four feet, um, but they're certainly within the critical root zone of the tree um, where all this work is gonna happen. Also, there's, there's a number of trees, I believe either on the neighboring property down the hill or on the edge of the property down the hill. I'm concerned that the removal of all this material will destabilize them as well. And if it's ledge, or boulders, which I think was the applicant stated, the boulders of the size that exist in this area of Arlington will definitely require chipping to be removed. I can't believe that it can be excavated and removed without serious disturbing of the entire front area. So I think there are a number of, of, of serious issues related to this, this approach, only to basically address the convenience of parking in the front of the yard as opposed to on the street. I think it's it's an extreme solution that's got a lot of risk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, next on our list um, 
is uh, Anson Stewart. Hi, can you hear me, Mr. Chair? We can. Great, thank you. Um, I have a number of concerns about visibility. I apologize, I need your name and address for the record. Sorry. Uh, Anson Stewart, 12 Molten Road, which butts this property to the rear. Uh, I have a number of visibility concerns. I think I spoke to those at the initial hearing on this matter. Um, I think the, as you observed, the five and a half foot wall would really restrict visibility, but I think others will probably speak to those concerns better than I will. Uh, I, I'd just like to make two points, one very detailed and then one much more general. The first detailed one is I don't think the numbers on the plot plan add up. Uh, it's proposed to be a 20 foot slab as the interior dimension. Uh, add one foot for the wall on each side, so that's 22 feet, plus four feet from the tree gets you 26 feet. I think the distance from the tree to the edge of the staircase is actually substantially less than 26 feet today. Uh, so I'd like some clarity on that, whether they're planning to relocate the staircase as well, which I don't believe is shown as proposed on the plan. The second comment is much higher level, and that's just, I do not see how this can meet the second criterion required here. Um, I don't see a substantial hardship. Parking on the street is not a hardship for the neighbors to the left or the right. Uh, so I just, I don't see how this, this uh, variance request could be granted as, as creative and intriguing as, as some of the solutions are. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Mr. Stewart. Um, so- Ms. Van, if you could hold off, I'm gonna go ahead and- sure the next person and then we'll come back with um and, and to address the, those questions um so with that i would uh ask for uh Ms. laurie medeiros hi um i'm laurie medeiros i live at 21 highland ave which is um budding on the downward hillside of 25 highland ave um I also, I, I'm just wondering why a variance would be needed if there's on-street overnight parking. There'd be, you get two parking spaces per unit um, and they are overnight parking spaces. So to change those into a driveway seems more like a luxury than an actual um, extenuating circumstance needed. Um, I don't think really that the mirrors and the lights and the noise and all of that unfortunately will really deter an accident happening when my parking is still in front of this driveway and they're still gonna be parking on the other side. So it may help if somebody's walking up the sidewalk um, possibly, but I don't think it's gonna help if they're backing out into the street because they're already going beyond the width of a car into the street and cannot see. Um, I also am kind of strongly opposed to um, touching this ledge. Uh, this ledge actually, 17 Highland Ave, which is next to me on the other side, has this ledge in their basement. So a big portion of this ledge is actually sticking out of their basement floor. This ledge goes straight through all of these houses um, and to begin to excavate that, I think would be a, a detrimental to the properties, the walls, the foundations of the houses around this property. Um, and I, I just don't really see how that would, you know, really be <laughs> worth it in the long run when there are two parking spaces on the street that go with the house. Um, as far as um, Ms. Van saying that there was, there's no um, issue with um, water between my house and the house that she is renovating, there is, I have pictures, images, I have video of this said water when we've had rain, since the snow has come, the water actually comes out through the wall. It's not even actually coming over the wall. So there is no drainage system behind that wall that go, runs a length of our yards in between the two houses. Um, as I said before, that land was taken from the basement and never left the property and just dispersed from the sun porch back and up um, the backyard. So now we have runoff going towards Mr. Anson's house in the back, which is running into his garage and coming down through 
that wall because I still have never received, nor have I seen any kind of a plan of what they actually put in for drainage there. So I would question what drainage would be going in in this front area for a driveway, because again, that would be putting more pressure on the property on my side, um, my foundation, my wow. stairs are on that side. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's kind of one of those things. And still, as I have requested many of times because the wires to my property run through that tree. And that was one of the main reasons why they put the tree in, I think. Um, that tree has still not been protected. They, just like they said, they had somebody out there looking in, they had a, 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 um, a front uh, digger to, to look in it that was, it ran into the tree. The tree needs to be protected. That tree cannot just, you know, sit out there. They have still not protected any of the trees in the yard. So I still have a lot of other issues <laughs> that are currently still going on. I mean, I've had their siding come off and, come into my house and actually rip the the um window um screen on my on my back back of my house just the other day so I, I think that there's a lot of things going on here with this house in the driveway is just going to add more on top of what is already here and I don't really think that putting a luxury driveway in unless there was somebody who already currently lived there and you know something spectacular that they needed I could see I've lived here for 25 years I've gone up and down the driveway I bought I mean the stairs I brought my trash cans up and down the stairs I've parked in front of the house I've bought a baby up and down the stairs I've been pregnant up and down the stairs so it, it, it can be done if somebody wants to buy the property they will live there and they will love it just like I have and that's I guess all I have to say thank you so much thank you Is there any further public comments or questions in regards to this application? Seeing none, I will go ahead and close the public comment on this. Um, Ms. Materials, the, the, the question that was raised by Mr. Stewart about the size of the pad. So on the plan, it's showing a 20 by 18 pad. Is the intent that the retaining walls are on top of that pad or are they beyond that dimension? So intent to have a clear 20 by 18. Okay. However, the plans, um, the plot plan, all the measurements were done by the professionals. So measurements are done um, that from my explanation to the land surveyor looking for clear 20 by 18 um, pad um, for parking. Um, I can go back. So um, on the left side where a staircase is, <clears throat> staircase will be removed and replaced. <clears throat> um, however, on the right side, mm -hmm. given into the consideration the size of the wall, um, I have to verify that those dimensions. <clears throat> because it appears that you would need to, you know, the, the wall itself would extend a foot beyond right. that dimension on three sides. And then the footing underneath is going to extend out beyond that as well. Correct. Um, an additional foot. So it will be more than more. Uh, it's going to look more 18 by 18, um, 18 by 17. So the, so if the 20 by 18 is the clear dimension, then the outside of the footing is going to be, you know, two feet all on all three sides. Right. Okay. So with that in mind, you're talking about you would be replacing the steps. The steps order. have to be replaced no matter what. They are um, just right now. They're not in the, the sh not. They are in a bad shape. They are not leveled. Okay. Um. This in this materials is questions. Um, we do have the, we have the report from, uh, the geotech that, um, it is, as he had described it, it's sort of bouldering ledge. So it's not, it's not a continuous ledge, but it's just, it's 
broken that's, up. Illnesses that some... was explained to me and uh, Geotech, <clears throat> the name of the person is Mark. Yes, Mark. Mark, what he explained to me, um, it is possible. It's not impossible solution. It's not uh, impossibly dangerous uh, job to do. Um, in this case, this company, um, Adwork Geotechnical Engineering, they will be on site um, working, mm -hmm. making sure that's done appropriately. And um, I, I do appreciate everybody's comments. Um, it's not, <clears throat> I'm not an engineer. I am uh, just developer. Again, this is mine, my husband's business. We hire a uh, specialist to do uh, certain tasks that we cannot do. Just like, you know, average person will hire accountant to do the accounting. I'm, that's for that reason we hired engineer, uh, land surveyor for the land, architect for our, our plans. To the to concern um, of um, Miss Laura there is again the water issue. We have sent people out. If she has uh, records and concerns, uh, Miss Medeiros, you do have our email. You do have our numbers, and yet you always choose to have this uh, voicing your concerns over the public hearings. You could email us, you could call us. We met on site multiple times. Your husband met uh, with my partner on site, uh, working on your house while we're working on this property. This property just received a full permit to work on. And for that reason, we were not to the property because we didn't have a full special permit approved. It was just received and we're coming back to work. So all the protection will be in place. I'm on top of this as I know how important Mr. it is. Mr. Chairman, yep. um, I think, you know, just to restore decorum that both Ms. Bond and Ms. Madero should be addressing the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, um. So ultimately that's decision to, uh, to the board on approving this or not, um, I try to address all the issues to the best of my ability. Um, it, and it's really, um, I will respect any decision made. Okay, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so I don't, I, I don't wanna get into too much of a back and forth um, between the applicant and the next door neighbor, but the, the, the neighbor who has requested um, to speak for a second time and unless there's a objection from the board i'm going to go ahead and allow it um and just request that that ms medeiros uh make her points to to myself as the chair so ms medeiros yes mr chair um so at the last meeting i was told that there was going to be a a, a, a water groundwater testing that they had to submit a report and all this other other information and that there was going to be that they were going to let us know what the what the drainage system that they used and how it's going and it, I mean right now it's going towards me so I'm just wondering where is the drainage system and all that information that, that's all that I was saying so this isn't a back and forth this was discussed at the last meeting and I have not gotten any information regarding that since so we're moving on to the driveway now and as I've said before these are all concerns of mine because my house is on the downward slope. They have built their house, their land up three feet. And in that three feet now is now change the, the direction of how the water is coming down the hill of Highland Ave and into my property and into the subsequent properties around me, behind me and, and everything else. So it, it, it is a concern of mine. And as she has, I, I don't know, that's I guess all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Medeiros. Um, Ms. Ban, I know that in the, the details that were provided at the, at the prior hearing in regards to the wall that's constructed on the downslope um, adjacent to the property at, at uh, 21 Highland, it's indicated that um, it's, a, you know, it's a masonry wall, it has crushed stone on the uphill side of it, and that there's a four inch drainage pipe that's included in that detail. Um, so I just wanted to follow up with you on that. Where does that drainage pipe lead? So based on the plans that uh, were submitted as a condition for a special permit, 
that drain pump it, uh, it's turned into our lot away from um, 21 Highland Ave. But does it does it drain water onto the top of the soil or does it go down into some kind of a French drain? Does it? No, it, it just goes to the top of the soil. But um, I want everybody under to understand. I had geotech people on site and they told me there is no water issue. We have done this again as a courtesy and there is no water issue. It's only three foot, three feet wall. How that wall can change direction of the water. I, again, I'm not a specialist. I hired people for that and that was submitted. So. Okay. All right. All right, so moving on from that question. Um, so at this, um, so for the board, um, so we have before us is this is this application for a variance, and as we had said before, there's the four variance criteria that we need to address, um, and essentially the first two are really the gatekeepers. And if we agree that if we can make a finding on the first two, um, that then allows us to proceed uh, to the third and then to the fourth. So. Um, the, let me go and find the original application, which is here, and pull that back up. So this is the initial um, application. Um, so the first criteria is to um, Describe the circumstances relating to soil conditions, shape, or topography, especially affecting such land or structures, but not affecting generally the zoning district in which it's located that would substantiate the granting of a variance. Um, and so the topography of the, so the, the issues on the site um, for soil conditions, obviously, it's there is um, something under the surface. Uh, that has caused prior owners to uh, construct a retaining wall along the along Highland Avenue, and that has occurred at the adjacent properties as well. Um, and that wall makes it impossible to um, create off-street parking, which is um, a requirement under the building under our our zoning bylaw. Um, the question I sort of have in general for the board is, is that, do we feel that those circumstances um, affect just this property or is this something that we feel is more generally affects the zoning district? So this is in, in the, the two family zoning district adjacent to Massachusetts Avenue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Uh, <clears throat> at least on this one, I mean, it's obvious that topography and soil conditions are at the source of the applicant's predicament. Um, and so the question is, is three housing, three families, three housing units general enough that it should be thought of as something for town meeting to take into account in a broad way uh, or whether it's relatively unique. Uh, and I think that given the case law on this, that, uh, that the application passes muster on, on this one, that we're only talking about three. If we were talking about dozens and dozens, or even a substantial amount more, it would be a little different. And we have to be careful about that because the ledge and rock is omnipresent in the western part of the county. But the particular of this town, but the particular problem that this applicant has uh, is really an a problem that is shared by two other units. And uh, I think that that is sufficiently focused that uh, the applicant gets by uh, criteria number one. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. 
Any other questions? Any other opinions from the board in regards to criteria number one? Hearing or seeing none, I'll move on to criteria number two. Um, to describe how a literal enforcement of the provisions of the zoning bylaw, specifically relating to the circumstances affecting the land or structures noted above, would involve substantial hardship, financial or otherwise, to the petitioner or appellant, appellant, excuse me. Um, so in this case, this is in regards to the, the zoning bylaws prohibition against creating parking spaces within the front yard setback. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I have a view on this one too, which is sort of cuts in the opposite direction from the one I had before. Uh, earlier this evening, Ms. Ben summed up what her objective was and really what the hardship is. And what she said was, what she's just trying to accomplish here is something that will contribute to the comfort and convenience of the new owners. And to me, that's not unreasonable. That's not an unreasonable hardship. Uh, I know that we have recently had a case which also involved uh, a question of parking, and I was in the minority on that one as well. But the record was really different in that case. Here, we've got a record in which the people, the other people who shared this problem, say, as Ms. Madero says, that she's had no problems with this at all. She's climbed this up pregnant after the baby was born, she had the baby in her arms, uh, that this has not been an unreasonable hardship to the other people who share the condition that Ms. Ban is pointing out. And I don't think that the comfort and convenience of the new occupant is, is uh, even arguably uh, a hardship. Now, I will say that to some extent, I'm peeping beyond to the next issues, um, because if this were all completely completely flat, if there was nothing on the other side, uh, you know, there's always a temptation, I think, uh, to view this particularly sympathetically. Uh, but I will say that as we get on to the other ones, I am inclined to agree with, um, with Mr. Stewart that there are lots of risks here. Uh, there are lots of potential problems. Uh, there's the applicant has done, gone way beyond the call of duty to try to uh, resolve those. But in my mind, it's not completely convincing. It's not that all the questions are answered. And I don't really want to be for us to be in a position if things go wrong, if some of those risks come about uh, of having pushed hard against unreasonable hardship. Uh, in order to get to those questions. So I think that the applicant doesn't make it on two. And if the applicant doesn't make it on two, the applicant doesn't make it at all since you need to meet all four. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Um, other opinions from the board? Mr. Chairman? Mr. DuPont. So I would just echo what Mr. Hanlon has just said. And I was just struck by the fact that the application itself says that it's an inconvenience. And I do think that it's always important to maintain the distinction between uh, inconvenience and hardship. And I think that they're two entirely different things. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Mr. Chairman. It's Mr. Mills. I weigh in with my brothers on these two. I think it's more of a convenience than a hardship we're resolving here. I don't think it meets the demands of the statute. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meltz. Anything further on this? So at this point, we do have um, several opinions in opposition to um, the second criteria. Um, I'll go ahead and let's discuss the, the, the final two and then um, we can come back and address the, the conditions again. Uh, excuse me, not the conditions, but the, um, the, the individual findings. 
So what, the third is describe how desirable relief may be granted without substantial detriment to the public good. Um, for me, this is one I have concerns about. I, I appreciate the research that the, the applicant has done in terms of trying to come up with uh, ways to make exiting um, this driveway safer, but this is you know a residential neighborhood. This is on a, a primary pedestrian route and uh, it's a sidewalk that receives a fair amount of use and it's immediately adjacent to a crosswalk. And we're talking about a five foot wall, um, which a car would be you know, coming around the corner of, and certainly all the, uh, uh, my concerns with the, you know, we could try to put a mirror, um, but the mirror's gonna have to sort of stick out a little bit into the sidewalk, I think, in order for it to really work. Um, the, and the sensing system with the, you know, basically it's either gotta be, the, I mean, the car is gonna be parked pretty much right with, at the edge of the curb, at the edge of the sidewalk. There's really not time for a system such as that to trigger in order to, um, to alert passersby that the, the car is backing out. Um, and the, you know, there's a tree right there and there's cars parking on the street. So um, I have considerable concern that, you know, they're, they're, that this driveway, if allowed, could be exited safely um, on, a regular, on a regular basis. Um, are there other comments from the board in regards to criteria three? Mr. Chairman. Mr. DuPont. So um, as you do, I live in that neighborhood and I'm very familiar with that stretch of Highland Avenue. And I would make a couple of observations uh, having lived on that street for more than 20 years. Uh, first of all, not only is it a heavy pedestrian route, but it's a lot of uh, school kids who are using that, that route. And so I know that they travel in groups and I'm just not even sure that with those uh, different uh, methods of warning that kids are really paying attention even if a light is flashing or they hear a noise. I just think they're absorbed. I know that the high school cross country team runs up and down Highland Avenue. So I'm really uh, more concerned about the safety to the kids. And I realize that there are neighbors there too who are coming back and forth as well. But I think that the children are of particular importance in this particular case. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Other comments from the board? Mr. On. Chair, I think um, with the oh. eyes um, adjacent to the pedestrian, um, it, the the sensor system might I don't know the how that will impact with snow and all that I think um, it's a detriment in that sense. Thank you for that. Um, then criteria four: How desirable relief may be granted without nullifying or substantially derogating from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaws. Um, so by my sense on this is the you know if the if the parking space was allowed um, you know certainly there there are a lot of instances of parking in the front yard that occur throughout town um, so having cars in the front yard would not um, substantially derogate from the intent or purpose of the zoning bylaw um, but the the high walls on the side um, do give me pause because it's, you know, that, that's in violation of a different section of the zoning bylaw. Um, and, you know, that's there for specifically for uh, the safety of, of other residents. And that would, I think that'll be difficult to maintain in this case. Um, other comments on four? Seeing none. Um, so I would go back. Um, I believe, I'm trying to recall the, on the, the prior variance application if we had voted separately on the different uh, criteria as fine as individual findings, or if we had just done a final vote on the um, on the variance request itself. Um, Mr. Hanlon, do you recall what we had done? 
I don't remember. Um, I don't remember. The, I do think that it, it, it's, well, we could do each one, but, you know, all, all the applicant has to do is fail on any one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, it isn't actually necessary to go beyond the first one where the applicant fails on. So I'm not sure that we need to make a specific finding for each one. The variance is a question of grace rather than right in any event. Uh, if the board isn't being totally arbitrary, at least it could basically say no for without making any of these findings. The findings are necessary for the applicant to win, but not necessary for the applicant to lose. Um, but that being the case, if 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 we want to do a vote on each one, each one of them, that would probably be it would be OK. Mm -hmm. um. I think if, with that in mind, I would just ask the board, is the board prepared to move to a final vote or do we want to vote individually on the, well, I see one vote for the proceeding directly to the main vote. I agree with that. I agree. Thank you. I agree too, yeah, Mr. You too. Thank you all. Okay, so with that, uh, may I have a motion in regards to 25 Highland Avenue. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. I move that the application for a variance for 25 Highland Avenue be uh, disapproved. So this is a motion to deny the variance for 25 Highland Avenue. Second. And seconded by Mr. DuPont. Okay, so as written, um, this is a motion to deny the variance request for 25 Highland Avenue. Um, so in this case, a yes vote is a is voting for the denial. Just to make sure everyone is aware of what it, yeah, what what the votes mean. Um, so with that, um, we'll do a roll call vote of the board. Mr. Dupont, aye. Mr. Hanlon, aye. Mr. Mills, aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli, aye. And the chair will vote aye. So uh, the variance application for 25 Highland Avenue um, is denied. We'll go ahead and we will uh, prepare the um, appropriate information for that and get that back out to the applicant as soon as possible. Thank you. Well, I just want to uh, uh, thank you everybody for time and um expertise knowledge and all the sharing comments um that was very valuable and as i said i appreciate and respect decision one way or the other um i love the town we've been working in it and i i i probably will see everybody again on maybe <laughs> different occasion that i that i have to say thank you thank so you. much have a, have a nice night thank you thank you too. thank you okay with that um the next item on our yep um Next item on our agenda is uh, item number eight, docket 3678, uh, which is 108 Pleasant Street. Um, so this is an application that had come before the board previously, um, but there were some issues in how it was advertised, um, which the owner was gracious enough to uh, continue so we could get that resolved. So this is officially a special permit request uh, for 108 um, Pleasant Street, which is a request for a, to convert the building to a three unit uh, dwelling, which is allowed in the zoning district by special permit. Uh, so with that, um, I would uh, reintroduce Mr. Coiner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, the purpose for tonight's meeting, as you said, is to acquire a special permit. So I'll just quickly review some of the data regarding the property. And it was, uh, it's in R4, R4 uh, district, uh, zoning district. It was constructed in the 1890s by Charles Devereaux, which I believe is possibly Devereaux Street. And uh, he lived in there for quite some time. Uh, starting in the early 1990s, it was converted to a psychiatric 
unit and I had received a special permit. And that special permit is probably in the bowels of uh, the <laughs> town of Arlington. And it, can, it was used basically as an office. There were office cubicles built throughout the whole building, which I have uh, removed. So it was used as offices up until about 2019. And then it was bought by Kanchen, a Hong Kong real estate group. And that was in 2014, it sat empty until 2016, at which time I bought it. So I've owned it since 2016. The building has been empty since 2014. So I've been developing as a three unit residential building as shown on the plans that you have. Uh, the lot is at the corner of Pleasant and Atkinson and it faces, or Addison, I'm sorry, it faces uh, Pleasant Street. The lot's 14,401 square feet. It's a large yellow Queen Anne style house. The floor area as submitted with the architect is uh, 8,302 square feet. And that's over five floors. Uh, the floor area ratio is 0 0.57. Uh, for the purpose of three units, we're combining the first floor with the basement. That's 3,670 square feet, including two bedrooms and two baths on the first floor, an in-law apartment that has one bedroom and two baths in the basement. The second floor is the second unit, 2,257 square feet, three bedrooms, two baths. The third unit is the third and fourth floors. That's 2,375 square feet, three bedrooms, three baths. There are front and rear entrances with stair access to each level throughout the house. Uh, there's approximately 11 to 13 parking spaces, uh, depending if the driveway is included. So that, uh, those are the specifics regarding the building that I have. And it's just to review the neighborhood, uh, my neighbor across the street, uh, across Addison is 100 Pleasant Street. It's a fairly comparable building, uh, slightly large, or slightly smaller. I'm sorry. Well, it is a bit smaller. It's 4,592 square feet. And they have six condo units in there, uh, ranging from 501 to 1,240 square feet, averaging 765 square feet. So that's on a smaller lot than what I have. So that's on the Arlington Center side of Pleasant Street. On the Route 2 side of Pleasant Street is a large brick uh, apartment building that was converted to condos quite some time ago. There's 27 units there. Uh, they range from 616 to 987 square feet, so nothing over 1,000 square feet. So that's to either side. Across the street from me is 105 Pleasant Street, uh, somewhat similar building. Uh, it's uh, 3,835 square feet with three condos. They range in size from 980 to 655 square feet and they average 1,278 square feet. Behind me on Addison Street is a single family residence. That's 4,420 square feet on a 4,656 square foot lot. So that explains my immediate vicinity. Uh, obtaining th a three unit uh, special permit on a building that has over 8,000 square feet is, I mean, the average size of the units in my building will be well over 2,000 square feet, which compares with less than 1,000 feet to either, uh, either side of me. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, a quick question for you. Are there any changes to the exterior of the building? No. Uh, so this is just flipping through the remainder of the plans. This is the proposed basement plan. You had mentioned an in-law apartment. Oh, in the yeah, see where the circular basement? staircase is? See where the circular staircase is, is a, on the Addison Street yeah. side? That connects the first floor with the basement. Uh, that's been changed because okay. I, I, having a circular staircase when you're getting older is very tough. 
So actually the front stairwell has been extended into the basement. And so the access from the first floor to the basement part of the, uh, uh, is through that stairwell. Okay. I call it an in-law, it's, it's, it's one continuous unit. Okay. So it's not a, it, it doesn't have a, a separate kitchen. Correct, we're, yeah, correct. we're limiting, yes. Okay. Um, basement level, first floor level. And then, uh, second floor, third floor. And then this is the attic plan here at the bottom. Correct. Both elevations for everyone. Questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hanlon, uh, what? <clears throat> it's my understanding that the this building is being used as a office for office use now. Is that correct, Mr. Corner? Uh, the office it was used as an office. The special permit was from the early 1990s for a psychiatrist from Brookline named Utowitz. And it, the special permit was for a, apparently some kind of psychiatric living space. It doesn't appear to have been used for that purpose. It was used for an office. It was the headquarters for his series of homes around the Boston area. And uh, <coughs> so it was used in office up until 2013, at which point it was sold. Thank you. Prior to 1990, the history is sketchy. The, the lady who gave me my vaccine shot said she grew up on Addison Street and she remembers a lot of kids living there. So there might've been some kind of group home or dormitory style something back in the 1970s. The last time the Devereaux lived there was uh, 1921. Cool. Other questions from the board? Being none, I'm going to go ahead and open this up for public comment. Um, again, public comment is taken as it relates to the matter at hand. It should be addressed through the chair. If you'd like to be recognized, um, please use the raise hand feature under the reactions tab, or if you're calling in by phone, you can dial star nine. Uh, so with that, uh, I will recognize Mr. Moore. Um, yes, Mr. Chairman, since I seem to be talking on everything here, why don't you uh... Uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Makawa, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, Mawaka, rather than me first. We can certainly do that if you prefer. Um, Mr. Makawa? Makawa, good. Um, can you hear me? We can, sir. Okay, I just want to make sure the microphone's working all right. Uh, just a question you had asked about exterior changes. Oh, and... I apologize. I have to name and address for the record. Oh, sure. It's, um, Steve McAlka, 17 Russell Street. I'm also chair of the Arling His Arlington Historic District Commission. Um, and you had asked a question about exterior changes. Um, just want to let, let the commission know that there were exterior changes done to this project that were in violation of the permit that has been issued by the Historic District Commission. And that is still outstanding. Um, so I don't know if that's within your purview, but that is a impact of this renovation on the character of the district that is still unresolved. Oh, at what point was that permit issued? Uh, I would have to go back and look at the date. What's your, I, what's I apologize, your I don't have that in front of me. I just saw this, I just happened to be at this meeting and saw that this was on the agenda. Oh, okay. I'd be happy to provide the uh, uh, certificate of appropriateness to the commission for their records. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so if you could, if you could forward that to Mr. Valarelli, that'd be great. Uh, and that is uh, in the building department's records as well. Oh, it we is. Okay. File all of our certificates with building department and with the town clerk. Perfect. Thank you so much. Sure. Um, 
Is that Mr. Moore? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, um, I'm glad Mr. Uh, Matauka could speak because he answered uh, one of my questions. Um, I, I, I did want to ask uh, a further question, though. Uh, is this building currently on the historical register or Arlington's version of that? I guess I would ask that to the applicant. Uh, no, it's not. Okay. Uh, I would ask, I'm actually going to forward that question to Mr. Makauka if I could as well. Um, that, that's, I, the, the, this structure is within the Pleasant Street Historic District. As okay. such, it is on the Arlington list of historically significant structures and is on the list at the MHC, the Mass Historical Commission of Historical Structures in the state of Massachusetts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, th thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Um, that's helpful, and I, it's a it's a beautiful piece of architecture. Um, I was just quickly looking at um, uh, a registration of it, and they call it the Architectural Swan of Pleasant Street. I thought that was interesting. Um, I'm uh, happy to hear that there's not going to be exterior changes. I uh, clearly this is a beautiful, magnificent piece of architecture, and I want to commend the applicant in going for that use versus an office use. Um, I know that an awful lot of the grand homes of Arlington have been turned into various versions of offices and insurance agencies and doctors areas and such. And, and although I understand that use it maintains the architecture, which is wonderful, uh, Arlington has a significant housing problem. And although these will be high-end expensive units, I'm quite sure um, I, I'm pleased to see that use. So I want to commend the applicant for turning it into housing, even though it probably will not be affordable housing, it will be beautiful housing. And uh, when I saw eight fireplaces, I was impressed. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Are there any further questions or comments from the, from the public? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment period um, on this application. Uh, so the application before us is a special permit because of the, the use um, that's being requested, which is a three family use. Um, certainly the, the structure is, is large enough for it and appears to be uh, set up appropriately. Um, the, the comment from uh, Mr. McCauka in regards to the Historic District Commission uh, does give me a little pause, but I think um, it might be appropriate for the board to um, include a condition that um, the building be made in compliance with the, um, excuse me, with the, uh, the, the certificate of appropriateness as issued by the Historic Districts Commission. There any further questions or comments in regards to this application from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, this is, I mean, as you can sort of tell, the, there, this is a non-conforming structure in lots of ways, but as long as it is on the existing foundation and there's no external changes, there's no extension of a non-conformity. The provision of the zoning bylaw under which the, this would proceed um, is intended to allow for the uh, conversion of one and two family dwellings of these large houses that exist up and down Pleasant Street uh, into sometimes offices and into sometimes uh, apartments or in this case, three family. And a key consideration of all of this is that the purpose of all of it is to preserve the uh, integrity of the older buildings that are there. Uh, and so consequently, I enthusiastically support the condition that the chair has uh, presented that, you know, going forward with this, going to put it three, which as a housing advocate, I, mean, I think it's a great thing and would have been okay if it had been four. Um, still, uh, it's very important to preserve the integrity of the, uh, of the structure. And, uh, and not make changes in it. And, uh, and I would be willing to support this, but only on the understanding that that would take, that would take place. Um, I'm sorry, can you repeat that, that last bit again? 
said I would be prepared to support this, but only under uh, only under the understanding uh, that the uh, that no changes be made to the uh, exterior um, of the building. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Dupont, first, please. I uh, just had a question about when we say, and I, I also support the application um, with the uh, proviso that it be made compliant, as you had already described. I'm just wondering, is that something that we foresee the building department uh, having the authority to make sure that there's compliance? Because it seems to me that that's what we're saying. Um, I believe that the where it is construction. That's actually a very good question, um, Mr. Valerelli. <laughs> uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. So the the hurdle before the applicant is um, the approval of the special permit for the third unit. That's just the beginning. It still has to go through the um, review process for uh, possibly sprinkler systems. Uh, I'm sorry, suppression systems and a host of other things that the building department will take over uh, if the uh, board approves the special permit. In regards to questions about the, the outstanding um, certificate from the Historic Districts Commission, is that something that the inspectional services would follow up on as well? Absolutely. That gets filed with the uh, building permit package, and uh, Mr. McCargo always sends us a copy. Uh, we would check that automatically especially because it is on Pleasant Street. Okay, because it, the, the representation from Mr. McCalka is that there was a prior um, a prior notice from their board that um, that there's work that is not being that was not done to um, to their directive. And so we just want to make sure that even though that relates to a prior um, you know, a prior issue on this property that that would be addressed if if we were to condition it with this special permit that it would be um, addressed at this time. It would be, Mr. Chairman, if it was a condition of the special permit. I am unaware of any prior um, notices from the Historical District Commission, but any um, any conditions set forward if the, if the board approves this will be followed. Okay, thank you. Um, I will call back again on, on Mr. Rakauka as, uh, as the chair of the Historic District Commission. Hi, uh, thank you for the recognition. Just uh, for the record, I was able to pull up a copy of the certificate, which was dated June 27th, 2019. Okay. And that has already been filed with the building department and with town clerk, and I'm happy to send along another copy to the um, ZBA if you'd like it for your records. If you could do so, that'd be great. Thank you. Appreciate that. Certainly. Any further questions or comments from the board? Um, seeing none. Uh, so the board has uh, three typical conditions, which um, we would include with any application before us. Uh, the first uh, is that the plans and specifications approved by the board for the special permit shall be the final plans and specifications submitted to the building inspector of the town of Arlington in connection with this application for zoning relief. There should be no deviation during construction from approved plans and specifications without the express written approval of the zoning board of appeals. Uh, number two, the building inspector is hereby notified that he's to monitor the site to proceed with appropriate enforcement procedures at any time to determine that violations are present, or, excuse me, are present. The building inspector shall proceed under section 3.1 of the zoning bylaw and under the provisions of chapter 40, section 21D of the Massachusetts general laws and institute non-criminal complaints. If necessary, the building inspector may also approve and institute appropriate criminal action also in accordance with section 3.1. And then number three is the board shall maintain continuing jurisdiction with respect to this special permit grant. Um, I had recommended that we have um, one that uh, building be brought into compliance. Compliance. 
with certificate of appropriateness as issued by Historic District Commission dated June 27th, 2019. Um, and then um, Mr. Hanlon had recommended, Mr. Hanlon, were you recommending that there be a condition as well? No, I think that it would be fine to stick with the condition we have. I do have a question that I wonder if Mr. McCalka could answer. Please. Um, the question, Mr. Chairman, is that is I just want we're being very specific about what certificate of appropriateness we're referring to. And I just want to make sure that there's no possibility that there may at some point as things move on, there's a, maybe an amended application or a renewed application or something that would lead to there being a certificate of appropriateness that isn't dated January, uh, June 27th, 2019s. Since I'm concerned that by being over specific, we could we could find ourselves really well that we may be all over specific and not taking into consideration all of the possibilities. I, I do not recall another certificate, but in the overabundance of caution, you may just want to say you no know, in compliance with um, the requirements of the certificate issued by the Historic District Commission and leave it at that. We could have it as the building. Um, shall we make compliant with the certificate of appropriateness as issued by the Historic District Commission? And just leave it like that with no date. That would make me feel more comfortable, Mr. Chair. Okay. And where the property has a, and thank you again, Mr. McAlka. Um, again, where the property has an existing special permit allowing uh, the office use, do we want to? Um, does our issuing a new special permit override that or do we want to rescind that? I'm not certain how that works. Mr. Vellarelli, do you know? I'm sorry, Mr. Chandler, can you repeat the question? Sure. The, there's a prior, the, the applicant has stated there's a prior special permit in place to allow an office use on the property. And we're wondering if that should be, if we need to make it, if, if we're you know, um, issuing a new special permit for three family, does that automatically get wiped or do we need to make a statement that, that, that we are superseding that? I, I, think, I think just to be on the safe side, um, that would be a question for town council, but I would put that in as a condition. Okay. I would just say the special, the prior special permit allowing office use is hereby rescinded. Okay. Is there anything further from the board? So we have the standard three conditions, and then the two additional one is the, the, that the building should be brought into compliance with a certificate of occupants, a certificate of appropriateness as issued by the Historic District Commission. And then number five is the prior special permit allowing office use is hereby rescinded. Uh, and unless there's any further questions or comments from the board, I would ask for a motion. So moved. Second. It may be that I ought to be. <laughs> I'm not sure that there was a so that I could, <laughs> that I should move that the application be approved subject to the three you know, standard conditions and the additional two conditions that the chairman just read into the record. Thank you, Mr. Handlin. Mr. DuPont, you, you still concur? It still applies. Fantastic. Um, then with that, a roll call vote at the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Chair votes aye. So that 
Uh, the special permit for 108 Pleasant Street is approved with the five conditions as discussed. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. You're very welcome. Good luck. Is this written down someplace then? So what will happen, uh, the board will write up a formal decision letter and we'll approve it at our next hearing, which is uh, coming up, I believe, April 12th. And then from there, there's a 20 day appeal period, um, but the decision will be filed with the town clerk. Okay. And you can follow up with, with Rick at any time if you have questions. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, with that, our next item um, is uh, number 3689, which is 46 River Street. Um, so this is a request for special permit. Um, I will just mention briefly uh, before moving on to this that, that the final docket on tonight's agenda, and I apologize for not mentioning this earlier, number 3688-44 Edmund Road, um, the applicant has requested a continuance. Uh, so we will actually not be hearing 44 Edmund Road. And if you've been hanging on for the last two hours, I apologize sincerely for not mentioning that sooner. Um, but uh, with that, we will move on to on uh, 46 River Street. Um, so with that, if I could ask the appl applicant to introduce themselves and tell us what they would like to do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, th and thanks to the board for uh, for this time and also especially thanks to Mr. Valieri for his good guidance in this process so far. Uh, my name is Dennis Lasco. I'm the homeowner at 46 River Street. Um, I grew up just across the river in Brookline and until recently my wife and I and our, uh, our son were living in a small condo just down the road in Somerville. Um, about a year and a half ago uh, at the height of the pandemic, we really fell in love with this house uh, and its character, some of the old, the brickwork, um, and uh, as well as Arlington. And we were lucky enough to purchase this from a family that's owned it for 70 years through several rounds of, uh, of renovations here and there. Um, we, we've since kind of fell in love with the house even more and the neighborhood even more, and we hope to own it for, for just as long. Um, at the same time, we have had a second child. We both often work from home, um, even outside of the bounds of uh, the current climate. And we often have in-home childcare and uh, we like to have people over. So someday we'd like to reclaim at least a part of our dining room for those purposes. Um, and as such, the space that was a bit small at first uh, has, has become really, really constrictive. Um, and, and you know, we don't want to deconvert it from a uh, two family um, as the, the additional rental income really helps us be able to afford the mortgage in the neighborhood and, uh, and provide housing. Um, so, so we do need more space, um, but under the current zoning, this lot is undersized. And, and my architect, uh, Wiley Brown, will go into detail on all this later. Um, in a moment, I'm just uh, introducing the project. Um, so we do need more space, but under the current zoning, the lot is undersized for a two family in terms of both square footage and frontage. And as such, even though it's grandfathered in as a two family, um, we, we need to defile for this special permit, which would otherwise be a by right addition of a half story. Um, no changes to the existing footprint of the building or the lot, um, or trees or anything of that nature. Um, while we do need more space, we also wanted a design that would preserve and highlight some of the unique and historic characteristics of the house. Um, and, and, I, and at the same time, kind of create something that's in relative harmony with the, with the neighborhood. Um, it also ties in, um, try, ties in the whole house rather than just feeling like a glued on piece. Uh, and so to accomplish this rather challenging design brief, I'm very fortunate to be able to be aided by um, local architect Wiley Brown, who has designed everything from skating rinks in Europe to geodesic domes in Costa Rica to most recently sustainable housing in Dorchester, which has won a BSA award this year. Um, he also happens to be a very close friend of mine since our 
freshman year in high school, thus making it possible for me to afford his services. <laughs> um, and so with that being said, I'd like to turn it over to him. And if uh, we could enable him to share his screen, he is here tonight. Um, he will present a, a brief kind of five minute, 10 minute visual of his design process and, and our, our joint thinking on how we came to this design. Mr. Valarelli, can you grant him permission to share screen? Mr. Brown? Yes, hello, I'm right here, Mr. Wiley Brown. Thanks, he's Dennis, for the introduction. He's, he's good to go, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, members of the board here. I'll, I'll set this up. Give me one moment, please. Okay. Let's go here. Can you all see my screen? You can, yes. All right, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hello again. Uh, I, I, um, yes, I'm Wiley Brown, an architect uh, in, in Massachusetts. I, I have, as, as Mr. Lasko uh, explained, I've, I've worked in, in many places around the world, but uh, particularly housing and, and housing in context to the local environment is really um, is something that, that, that is important to me. And I, I happen to be, you know, as, as he mentioned, we grew up in Brookline together. And, um, and so I'm familiar with the area and I do quite a work, a lot of work in, in, um, both Boston and south and around Boston area. This is my first project in Arlington, I will admit. So, um, so I'm excited to see how this goes. The, uh, so here, here's a picture of the house in context. Um, what's actually kind of interesting and unique about it is it's a structural brick house with this addition that was placed on a number of decades ago that's, that's uh, sided in vinyl. As Mr. Lasko mentioned, um, you know, here's, the, here's the neighborhood River Street on the corner of Warren and River. And uh, you know, I took a quick snapshot of the of the street, so you can you can see that actually the fact that it's a brick building is is actually somewhat unique to the, the particular area. Across the street are some newer 1970s brick condos, but um, but they're they're not of this kind of two family house variety. They're much larger. Um, so I mean, just going straight to the zoning, Mr. Lasco mentioned this. The um, it's the existing lot size and frontage size that are already too small, it's a non-conforming lot. Um, and, but according to the, the buy right, uh, you know, you notice in the, in the green box here, there is a possibility for more space in, in, um, in doing a half story and adding 10 feet to the height. So I saw that as, as an opportunity, but of course we were already set, the existing building was not conformed, but that was where there was some possibility with the, with the special permit. And so, you know, we basically said, what if we, we take the existing building and we add that extra 10 feet and add the half story of 660 living area and just pop it on top. Um, and, and we are, you know, in, in a way that that's respectful to the uh, existing historic uh, brickwork. And, and so just to see if that's even something that's, that's according, you know, um, looking at the neighbors to see if it's something that's actually relevant in this neighborhood. We looked at the, the kind of three adjacent neighbors in down River Street and over on the corner of Amherst Street and saw that, you know, the, the neighbor directly next to it is also two and a half stories, 35 feet tall. It's actually a little larger than we're proposing even after the proposal. The neighbor on the other side, on the right side is also 2.5 stories, 35 feet tall. It's not quite as large as what we're proposing, but it's in the, in the you know, very close to it. And then two doors down, again, slightly smaller, but two and a half stories, uh, 35 feet tall. Uh, those are both two family buildings as well. So it, it fits within the character of the directly adjacent buildings. And then of course, you know, as I said, I, being uh, context relevant is really important to me. So I, of course I, I looked at the, the Ar uh, Arlington residential guidelines, which I'm sure you guys are very familiar with, but the, the kind of bullet points that I pulled for a renovation to kind of go over it is, is one about this streetscape um, rhythm from principle 4A, that non-conforming lots should maintain kind of, you know, the existence of the, the streetscape uh, rhythm of building spaces. So that's you know, something I kind of held on to. Another one is that although a lot of what the, the um, design regulations talk about are kind of matching styles, it does give a little bit of a caveat for well-designed contemporary style side or re-additions that can complement the proportions of the main house in certain areas. So I kind of went a little farther and said, what is a, you know, according to these guidelines, what, do, what is a, a contemporary or modern? And it really said something about, you know, combining different geometric volumes in, in a certain way that's proportionally respectful for the existing. And so again, holding on to that for a second. And then, you know, in principle B3, really looking at matching materials for, for what's there. And um, 
you know, trying to, to you know, match or complement the existing materials. So these are things that I was really thinking about as we were trying to go through design. And so what's interesting though, is you know, this building, as I pointed out before, is inconsistent with the local trend. Most of the, as according to the report and what, what I've seen walking around the neighborhood, most of the buildings there, although they are two family, uh, they tend to be wood frame structures with clabbered or some, you know, some sort of maybe wood clabbered or some sort of faux wood, if, whether it's a concrete fiber or, or, or vinyl or, or some other variations. Whereas this one really is a historic brick building with, with some really wonderful detailing um, from, from you know, 1920s. And, and so um, just looking at, again, buildings around the house of how they, they sometimes create different patterns as you go up beyond two stories. And so here, change of, of pattern direction, as we see with some balconies out front, you know, here really change of colors and material that are, that are working with the, with the massing of the building to demonstrate that there's something, something different in that upper zone. Uh, open uh, upper level terraces, you know, seen with these kind of vertical striping as opposed to horizontal striping. And so I was trying to pull from these different uh, features that I saw around the neighborhood to, to put together a composition that, you know, you take the, the assessor's map here. And, and I, so I made some, some massing models really quick to kind of look at, look at how it would, would sit in the neighborhood. And so we see this is the existing condition and we have this kind of brick box, which is unusual on the street with this, you know, wood, or, or it's actually a vinyl sided front edition that somewhat matches the, the, the type of construction of the other buildings. And so the question was, how do we add some space on top? Okay, well, so if we, you know, pop up a little piece that really respects that edge of the brick, rather than trying to match structural brick, we, you know, we, we definitely go with a veneer. It would clearly, you know, it always kind of looks a little like it's obvious when you, when you put veneer brick over structural brick. So the thought was like, what if we match it with some other material? And we maintain the proportion, so it's, it is respectful of the of the, of the brickwork, but it you know puts its its piece out there, and it maintains that roof edge that's so kind of clear of a beautiful brick you know um, parapet that's actually detailed nicely. So the proportions of the addition complement the main house, but then it becomes a question of now we have these these little this bump out that's existing in the front and this bump out at the top. How can we start to to blend them together, kind of match the massing? And so the idea is like, what if we combine the geometric volumes? So we add a few little shade pieces for this um, outdoor uh, terrace that, uh, you know, that shades it, makes it a bit more pleasant in the summer. And then we combine, and it's this combination of two geometric volumes that are kind of interlocked. You have this, this massive um, brick main component and this kind of new contemporary um, additional component that, that kind of interlocks with it that's clearly not the historic, but but um, but in a, in a, in a newer contemporary piece to, to bring it up to, to contemporary uh, standards, and so then it becomes a question, you know, looking again down the street and that that sense of that street rhythm. And so here's the existing, and then we we put that that um, kind of extended gable on there. It kind of makes a nice little rhythm with the the gabled houses and the gabled dormer, and it kind of fil filters its way down with kind of a gable, gable, gable. Looking at it from the other side, the south side from from Warren Ave. You know, so you get this kind of pattern of, of, of gables that continue as opposed to the flat roof that, that it currently is. And so then it comes to a question of materiality. And, you know, do we, do we you know, it says like match or complement. And so do we match the vinyl? Well, you know, in sustainability, that's not, you know, in today we have different ideas about using plastics or, or these materials. Is that really a, a good thing to do? Particularly, it's not that much siding. Or, you know, really doing structural brick, it's hard to match brick anymore. It's gonna be very contrasting. So could we complement the brick? How could we, you know, emphasize the brick? And we see lots of examples, you know, in Boston around of really where, where brick and kind of standing scene metal come together nicely with like a gambrel feeling on top. It's a really standard way of, of you know, extending a, a roof, but it's clearly something other than the, the original mass brick building. And so this became the, the kind of idea if we could actually match the, the current addition to the materials of the new addition. So it becomes just two materials and we complement the existing brick as opposed to match it and, and make, make a clear reading there. And, you know, we have this idea of complementary geometric volumes and again, that interlock. And so this is the, the kind of intent behind um, what's going on here. I recognize it's a, it's a, it's a slightly more contemporary style than we, we, we see in, uh, on the street, but uh, it seems within the, 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 the realm of, of where the guidelines um, fit. And, and as this building is already unique in this environment, maybe adding, a, you know, keeping it a bit unique and, and celebrating what's actually historic by, by honoring that, by putting something that's clearly not historic 
um, as, as an addition to it. So um, throwing that out there, that's kind of the, the, the nature of the design. And you know, here we have the, the elevation as we see there, and um, it is adding about 600 and I forget how many, 50 square feet, 35 feet tall and proposing a two and a half story building. So that, thank you, Chair and members of the board. I'm very happy to hear your uh, comments and thoughts. Thank you so much, Mr. Brown. Um, so my, my, my first question is the, um, the portions that are going over uh, the porches at the two ends. Uh, what is the intention for how, for what that is and how that's assembled? Again, that's intended to be a, a kind of a shade structure. That would be outdoor space. And uh, it's basically to, to make a, a shaded porch. And the intention is it would be constructed of, of um, not two by timber, but slightly oversized timber that's, that's joined with steel joints at the end and, and capped with a, a, you know, a, a steel um, bit of, of roofing that, or not steel, but, but metal roofing that would uh, protect it from the weather. So it's meant to be an, an open kind of lattice, um, a, a pergola type of, of roof cover. So are they each individually freestanding or are they linked at the top? Oh, they would, they would be linked through, a, through you know, linear, um, basically like a, a piece of rebar, that, not rebar, excuse me, a, a, a threaded rod that goes through mm -hmm. and, and holds them at a certain distance in space and, and, and held from, from flapping around so that you, you don't deal with the, uh, the, 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 any, any movement. Okay. And, then, and so you're, re, you're proposing to reclad the addition over the front porch. Exactly. So, so it's, you know, picking a material that, that could be both a, a kind of roof and a wall, you know, kind of like we're talking about the gambrel, and yep. then having that extend so that it all becomes a uniform additional mass on top of the brick. So we're really only dealing with two materials. So the, the intent would be to, to reclad that to match the, the additional component that's extending up from the roof. Okay. And um, so obviously, you know, in reading through um, the, the zoning bylaw, the half story definition uh, from the town is that the seven feet is from the, the finished floor on the third level to the underside of structure on uh, for the roof. Mm. And I had seen before that you had had mentioned that the, the seven foot is listed as being the room height or being the ceiling height. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that you're aware that that number is actually to the ceiling structure. Um, and just to confirm that you you meet the requirements of, of having that top floor be less than 50% the volume, of, uh, excuse me, the floor area of the floor adjacent below. No, that, that's fine. I, I was not aware that, the, that it, was, it was finished, that it's, it's structured, but I think that's a matter of inches that we can certainly make sure is uh, implemented in the, in the construction. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, questions from the board, please? Seeing none. And once, by twice. <laughs> All right, with that, I will go ahead and um, open the hearing for public participation. Um, Again, we take questions and comments as they relate to the matter at hand. It should be directed through the chair uh, for the use in our deliberations. Um, if you are participating by Zoom, uh, you can use the raise hand feature under the uh, reactions tab. Or if you are on phone, you can dial star nine. Are there anyone who wish to comment? None at this stage. Um, going once, going twice. Go ahead and close the public comment period for this hearing. Um, are there are there any improvements being made to the uh, to the lot or the property itself that would impact its usability? No.
and the um, the existing well, uh, window well, and stairwell going to the basement. Those are existing. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Any further questions or comments from the board? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. Um, so I think this is a very interesting uh, proposal. Uh, just to come back for a second to what our responsibility is here, as I understand it, uh, while there are a number of nonconformities on this parcel, as there are actually throughout Arlington, uh, this proposal won't lead to an extension of, of any of them with the possible, with the exception of uh, usable open space. And we have a regular diet of cases of what we've come to call zero going to uh, uh, more zero. Uh, and it, it seems to me that, that uh, well, our, traditionally we have talked about that in language that related to the extension of the nonconformity, uh, but that's really in some ways not exactly what we're doing. Uh, the very fact that we give, uh, that we make a section six finding suggests that we are treating it as if it's an extension of the nonconformity. Really what's going on with uh, all of these zero to greater degrees of zero cases is that uh, it almost never uh, comes out that, that uh, there's any increased detriment when that's the only thing that uh, is the reason why the case is before us. Uh, and I think that we should be a little bit more clear about that as we go forward. Uh, but here from what I've heard so far, I don't really, uh, it seems to me that there really are no issues other than dealing with what our precedent has already resolved largely for us. Uh, so I would be apt to be in support of the application. Thank you, Mr. Newman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. Yes, uh, can I see a side view of the design, please? Brown, do you have that? Red uh, I do, yes, I can I can share my screen and and um, I appreciate screen. that. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Can you can you see my screen? Yep. Okay, here here is a side view for you, Mr. Board Member. I don't see a lot of windows up there. And I just wonder about alignment of windows with the current design. Yeah, that, that's actually one of the, you know, because that knee wall is rather low in order to, to keep the, the roof down. Uh, wall mounted windows, there, there won't be, there'll be more skylights above that won't be seen. And then the very end, so if I go back to this end here, the windows will mostly be on the end and the light will be coming through from, from either side. So actually this, these sides will have only, only skylights in the upper, upper section of the roof. And, and you know, very, I probably no windows in that side wall. So there won't be any, any concern because those won't actually be very, if we, if we look at um, that perspective view, you won't really see what's going on up in the, up in the roof area. So it's really just this front zone here. And then on the other side, on the back side, you have light coming in from either end, and then light coming from from the roof up here above. Thank you. You're welcome. Do you have a color set selected for the this the metal? Um, I, I, I we haven't uh, you know sat down and peeled samples, but I'm I'm leaning toward a, a kind of a, a darker gray that's very frequently seen um, with that goes with brick very very nicely. But it's something that that uh, we would definitely pick. On site, but it would be you know some sort of I, th I think a, a grayish or a setback gray. We've we've discussed the possibility of even you know doing copper, but mm -hmm. you know that's going to be uh, cost. Um, <laughs> we have to do some some costs on that. It's actually I find done. There's there's ways to actually bring copper, make it fairly effective and, and efficient and cost effective. But but that's that's something that we're, we're working. That would of course be very shiny in the beginning, and then after about three or four years, I'm sure you're familiar, it turns that kind of brownish, and then eventually green. But that's decades later. <laughs> <laughs> the chairman, um, Mr. Holly, do we consider this um, trellis or lattice portion in the area calculations for the 
um attic or um the half story um where it's outside the enclosure i don't think we do but that's a good question for Ms. mr valorelli do we include the covered porches on the third floor as a part of the half story calculation uh mr chairman can you hear me okay i'm having a lot of trouble yes yeah, so uh, porches and balconies are not included for GFA, so they will be not included uh, with respect to the half story. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Riccardelli. I think, uh, you know, I think I really appreciate how much uh, Carrie has put into the design and the presentation to us. Uh, today, you know, one thing I just wanted to bring up was, um, even though we're keeping with this with the two and a half story uh, in terms of square footage, uh, it does concern me slightly that because we're extending the volume, the perceived impact from a neighbor neighbor perspective uh, kind of feels like it's a larger, um, you know, kind of full third story, uh, and. What, what I see typically in this East Arlington neighborhood is that, uh, you know, it's kind of shed dormers and that sort of expression to uh, get that half story volume on top. So I, I'm just um, bringing it up to the board. You know, we're not reviewing the design here tonight, but I, I just uh, wanted to hear what the other board members thought about that. <clears throat> That was sort of my my initial take um, was that it you know typically on a, when there's a third story addition and there's a there's exterior space added it's a deck it's not done as a as a porch with a with a structure over the top um, and I appreciate here that it's not you know it's, it's it is open to the weather um, but sort of as you note it does sort of define an additional volume that comes much farther towards the street than it would in other cases. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mills. I share uh, Mr. Riccadelli's concerns about the verbal massing, especially from a street perspective. Um, I think it's very imposing looking. And, you know, I would suggest that they maybe cut that back in half and it would not be so imposing, still have the pergola, but maybe not extend all the way to the end. And I think that may be uh, a little less imposing from the street view, just a suggestion. Chairman. Mr. Hanlon. So, uh, I mean, I obviously defer to the tremendous expertise of all the architects and, uh, and that's not where I come from particularly, but, I, but this is my neighborhood, so um, I kind of know what it looks like. Um, if you looked at, at the photographs of the existing building, I think that what you notice is that um, because of the perspective of this drawing, it makes the building look taller than it is. Uh, in fact, your first impression when you look at it is that it's much, much shorter than the other buildings uh, that are on that side of, of the street. Uh, that isn't to say that it won't look sort of imposing to have the, what goes on, but if you look at this and compare this to the drawing, I think that you'll see that the apparent uh, the appearance of height and bulk is in the drawing is a little more than you're likely to have in real life. Uh, the other thing to remember is that this neighborhood includes both sides of River Road, uh, of River Street. And if you look on the other side of River Street, you have a large number of brick apartment buildings uh, that are much larger than any of the buildings that we're talking about on this side of the street. So when you're looking at the street skate in general, um, uh, um, unless you're wearing a patch over your right eye, uh, you're going to see a mix of sizes uh, uh, up and down the, the street. And at least for me, uh, I don't, I, and I guess it to some extent depends on just how opaque the, uh, uh, the pergola is, uh, but to me, it, it seems like it would fit into a harmonious street, streetscape. It, it, you, you have to recognize that it's not a harmonious streetscape as it is. 
Uh, it's a very diverse streetscape. That all of the houses look different from the other houses. It's East Arlington, and this house actually looks more different now than than any of the others because it's a different material and it's a different shape. Um, and so, in in some ways, it, it just will match the the diversity that already exists there. And I think that that it would add to the look of the streetscape as you're heading down towards the Mystic River. Uh, but whatever it is, I, I don't think that that it will, would, in, in truth, be quite as dominating as as you may infer from from uh, uh, from the drawings. Mr. Kevin, Mr. Mills. Uh, yeah, I'd like to point out that from the drawings or not, it is going to the maximum of 35 feet. So it, irrespective of the drawings, it's as tall as it's allowed in a residential structure. That's A. In B, Pat, it's true. The Johnson apartments across the street are bigger, but they're set way back from the road. They're not right on the sidewalk. You're not looking straight up at this. Uh, you know, and it goes right out to the very edge of the porch, which actually extends past the front of the house. So, you know, it's like you've built up a, an extension over the, the uh, front porch, which was already in addition. Um, I do think it's visually imposing from the streetscape. I'm sorry. Mr. Brown, what's the spacing on the, those frames? Uh, that, that, that's, you know, variable at the moment. At the, at the moment, they're about uh, 10 inches between the, the four inch wide pieces. And that's that's something that we can we can tune if there's a desire for it to be more uh, transparent. That's that's uh, certainly available for discussion. But just to add, I mean, this building as well, it, it's it's actually very close to being along the street line of, of this building, and it's also at the maximum 35 feet. And actually, the street slopes up a bit, and so this is measured 35 feet at about two feet higher than the base of um, four to six River Road. So actually. This 35 feet is actually at what would be 37 feet on our lot. So it is this, this point here of this gable that's very much right on the road is considerably higher than even this gable will be. Did you have a, a plan of, the, of that block? I have the, the set here. I'll, I'll sorry for the, the visual jumping through things here. No, that's perfect. But yeah, here, here's the plan of the, and here's, here's the, uh, the, the assessor's map of that, that block. Yeah, so I think I think what Mr. Mills is getting at is just that it's it's so much closer to the street edge as it is. Um, and it's that it's that portion over the over the front porch. I think that's the portion that's at least for, that's tripping me up at least. Um, I, I definitely appreciate that you're trying to sort of tie what's coming across the roof and to bring it down um, uh, into the front, but I'm sort of left feeling that it's bringing so much mass so far forward, um, even though you know it's not it's not a solid mass. Um, if that attic piece, rather than extending all the way to the front, ended at the existing building um, on the front side, would that provide in any way for what you're, what you're trying to do in terms of the, the continuity between the roof piece and the front piece? Um, I think, I mean, that's, that's what you kind of, you kind of see here is this, this, you know, it, it becomes a bit of a, a hodgepodge of, of backpack elements. And that's what we're really trying to to you know break apart and make it two stronger elements that just very simply sit together and yeah. and so you know if it's a matter of, of it feeling too massive as we said we we can tune that and, and design it to to be more filigrane and be you know a little bit low oh, sorry I think something's happening there something something lighter uh, in that but I think if, if we held it back we would still have an appearance of, of massing of still being a, a separate element. And this is one of the big design challenges of, the, of this building is really, um, you know, this thing is, is already a very different component to, to what's going on there. And so it's how do, we, how do we not make it a beautiful historic building with a bunch of weird add-ons that, you know, so it becomes a bit of a Frankenstein of, of different pieces. Really no, going for that idea of, of two volumes that are, 
that are married gently. And so, so that, you know, I, I know it's, it's kind of architectural mumbo jumbo, but uh, it, it is an idea of trying to, to maintain that, that simplicity and not get too confusing. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I think, uh, don't worry, you're in good company. There's a bunch of architects speaking <laughs> to you here as well. So uh, I, I think, I think, um, I think your uh, initial suggestion, uh, Mr. Chairman, about uh, maybe just playing with the porosity of that uh, trellis element to make it feel less like a solid mass coming right up to the, the face of the, the, that front porch that we're seeing in this image uh, and making it sort of articulated uh, that it's exterior space from a pedestrian uh, might just alleviate how big it feels kind of up against the streetscape. I mean, I also wonder sort of if it maintained the density to the front of the front edge of the building and then from the, what the portion that's over the porch, if that was, you know, <laughs> somewhere between, you know, 25 and 15 percent the density. And it really sort of ha gives you that differentiation between this is the building and this is the, the porch. Yeah. We're Chair. architects. We like to play with others' designs, so I don't. Want to <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm a professor of architecture, so I, I play with a lot of people's designs. <laughs> that's, that's what I do. <laughs> so. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I feel a little bit sorry for Mr. Lasco. He's not an architect, just like me, but he's watching his house get rede redesigned in front of him. I'm not an architect, but I I uh, I have to listen to Wiley. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You know, I got that. Uh, and I, I appreciate the input. You know, I want to. I want to make this uh, harmonious with the neighborhood. I like. I, you know, I like the idea of of that Mr. Brown is trying to achieve with with tying it all together. But I also like kind of some increased sunlight and porosity on that front end. So I I think if that's a solution that's agreeable to everybody, and, and we can handle that um whether whether it's increased porosity across the whole thing or just at the front end I, i'm happy to abide by that um certainly doesn't impact my use of that front area i mean, i think architecturally having it a little bit more dynamic could could actually be quite wonderful it's, it's a matter of you know doing a couple iterations and, and maybe it does it kind of becomes more ephemeral i think it could be quite a quite a great a great way of thinking about it Mr. Chair, I had one question or a thought here. Um, that portion, the, the current overhang on the second floor, what, what is it? Is, is it a porch that is being utilized or? It was, it was formerly a porch, an open porch decades ago. And then at some point uh, long before I purchased the house, it was uh, kind of wrapped in vinyl and uh, there was a, a nice floor put in. So we, we have it as a lounge area and a, um, a workout area in, in decent weather because it's uninsulated. Um, it, it is counted as part of the square footage of the second floor. Um, so it is residential space and probably as part of reciting it, we'll put some more, um, more thermally efficient windows and uh, some better insulation in and around it and, and kind of level out that floor. So it's, uh, it's just kind of a, a family room and, and workout area and uh, utility space. And... Is the original brick wall of the house still exposed on the inside of that room? Yes, and it will it will remain. I like to be on Zoom calls and people think I'm working at a startup when I have the brick <laughs> 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 All right, well, it certainly sounds for the discussion that, you know, for the most part, we're, we're in favor. It's really, it's just this, this front part that we're, um, that we're a little uncertain about. So if you would be willing, we would, um, I think I would recommend that we continue to, um, to April 12th, which is our, our next hearing date. Um, and if you could come back to us with, with some, um, some alternatives, that would be a, a great way to proceed. 
I think I think that's manageable from my end. How does that sound to you, uh, Mr. Lasco? Yeah, so April 12th would be kind of a, a similar meeting to tonight. And yes, we, we would have you on first. Okay. Would. That's perfectly acceptable. Any any further comments from the board? Anything else you'd like to see um, for a follow-up? I'd like to see two designs, one cutting back to the front edge of the house and one otherwise, as long as we're going to play. Okay. Perfect. Okay, then with that, I would take a motion to continue uh, the special permit hearing for 46 River Street until April 12th. 2022 at 7.30 p.m. This time so moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. Do I have a second? second. Mr. DuPont. And before we enshrine this, Mr. Valerelli, that is the correct date, right? It is. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so vote of the board, Mr. DuPont? Aye. Uh, Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Mr. Holly. The chair votes aye. Did we lose Mr. Holly? We lost Mr. Holly. With that, we are continued. Thank you very much. Appreciate your sticking Thank with you. us. Appreciate the uh, time. You're very welcome. So for the board now we get to do all the boring stuff. Uh, I punted on at the very beginning. So moving back to the administrative items, the first is the approval of the meeting minutes from the February 22nd meeting. Um, so these were distributed to the board. I believe Mr. Valerelli has comments on these. Are there any further comments on the meeting minutes from February 22nd? Seeing none, may I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Uh, vote of the board. Um, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon? Aye. Mr. Mills? Aye. Uh, Mr. Riccardelli? Aye. Uh, Mr. Holly is no longer with us. Mr. Chair. Uh, and the chair votes, uh, yes, Mr. Hanlon. Uh, we have a message from Mr. Holly who's trying to get back on. He had a laptop oh. that was low on power and uh, and he was involuntarily terminated and is now working his way back. Okay, keep an eye out for him. Um, the next item uh, I have listed as the uh, review of proposed zoning warrant articles. So what I had wanted to do here, um, so the ARB is reviewing um, proposed uh, warrant, art warrant articles in relation to zoning. Uh, this is what they, what they do every spring before town meeting. Uh, there are a number of them on the docket. And I had wanted to just basically walk through what they are with the board. Um, and the intent here is not to really hold a debate on them or you know, necessarily go through the merits of them, but just to make sure that everyone's aware of what's going on. And then if they do have comments, um, comments should be submitted to the, uh, to the ARB, to the redevelopment board um, as they move forward. And then once they appear for town meeting, um, those would be uh, you would talk to your town meeting members. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and quickly share this. So the, they're holding a series of hearings. They've had the first three. Uh, um, and then the, their final one is on the 28th of March. And then at their the first meeting in April, they'll be voting, I believe, on the uh, the final amendment or uh, languages. So, um, so the the first one 
uh, which most people I think have heard of is um, it's a citizen article to allow two families to be built by right in the R0 and R1 zoning districts. Um, so this would basically, in the R0 and R1, rather than only allowing single family housing by right would allow single and two family housing by right. Um, the second one is the enhanced business districts. Um, so this is seeking to, uh, let me go ahead, it should be showing you these. That's this one here. Um, so it's improvements. Um, I unfortunately wasn't at the hearing for this one, so I'm not as up to date on it, uh, but it's to inc increase pedestrian, uh, so it's bylaw section, encourage pedestrian activity, maintain an active street, and limit the amount of ground floor retail space occupied by banks, offices, lobbies, and other non-active uses when feasible or to take any related action. Um, so the, there's language here. All of this is available from the ARB's website. Um, next one is on street trees. Uh, which is basically to require additional planting of street trees, uh, one every 25 feet. The next one is solar energy systems. Um, the six site development standards. So this relates more, I believe, to environmental design review, which is the ARB's review process to encourage the implementation of solar um, in projects under their jurisdiction. Um, the administrative amendments, this is just basically corrections and um, typos that they're amending. Um, uh, zoning expansion of the business districts. So there are five properties um, on Massachusetts Avenue, uh, sort of at the corner of um, Marathon Street. Uh, there's three houses on that side and one on the other, and they are actually um, currently zoned as R2 and R5, and the recommendation is to rezone that area as B3. Um, and so that, so it's these properties here, the, um, this is the, the Capitol Theaters up here, uh, and I think this is Fox Library is here just to give you a little context. So it's these properties, this is the multifamily apartment house this is a two-family condo this i think is three apartments and this one across the way i believe is also three apartments and so this is b3 up in this way so it would just extend the b3 through here and then these i believe are b2 next one is about zoning map amendments and this deals with notification of abutters in the event of a change in the zoning map um, and then apartment parking minimums. So currently, you know, as we're very familiar, single and two family housing requires one per unit. This would, but in apartments, we require more than that. And so this would bring that all into alignment so that um, basically all residential would be one <coughs> parking space per unit. Uh, the next one, open space uses um, is to, change the uses that are allowed in the open space district, uh, basically to more align with our current, with town's current practice. Uh, next one, restaurant uses is, would be increase the amount of score, uh, the amount of area that a restaurant can occupy before it requires a special permit. Because currently that's at only 2000 square feet. So this would, is proposing to double that to 4,000. Um, so appeals, this has to do with uh, once, if the zoning, if the inspectional services has determined that there's a violation, um, how long uh, the occupant has to remedy the situation and how long the, the special services has to try to remedy the situation before um, it would actually come before our board because we would be the next level of appeal. So that's this one. Um, and then the mixed use of business districts basically change would the proposal initially is to change the FAR um, in all the business districts to B2 through B5 to four, 
uh, to encourage the development of more mixed use in those districts. Um, and then the next few are ones that I had put forward um, on behalf of the board. Uh, one is to add a definition for porches and to add porches to the list of um, things that can project into the minimum yard because the currently that is omitted. Um, so the term porches here should be underlined as well. But this is just basically to bring the zoning by law to alignment with our current practice. Um, yard encroachment, this has to do with that when you create a porch, um, that it does not create a space that you can then enclose by right, that if you want a porch and we approve it by special permit, that's fine. But if you then want to go ahead and enclose it, you do have to get a special permit. You do have to revisit the permit. Uh, large additions, um, two parts. One is to just clarify that it's the lesser of 750 square feet or 50% of the building's gross floor area that is considered, with, is the threshold for being a large addition. Um, and then there's some questions back and forth about what is included in that calculation, whether the current, uh, currently in special services does not include portions of additions that where the, that square footage is in, within the existing footprint of the house. So it's only the portion that's beyond the footprint of the house. Um, and there's been some questions back and forth. So we're just having the town clarify very clearly as to what's included in that calculation. Um, Next one has to do with the rules and regulations for the Zoning Board of Appeals. Currently, there's a very large section that is additional rules and regulations that are in the zoning bylaw. So we can't actually change them and it takes two thirds vote of town meeting to change them. So we are asking that those all be stricken um, and that it, what just remains is what's in actually in, under state code, which is that the Zoning Board of Appeals should adopt its own rules and regulations. Uh, then the further tweaking of half story, um, because the part of it, it, the definition is getting very regulatory all of a sudden. Um, and so there was a request to basically change it so that there's a definition which is much more, much uh, smaller. And then there's actually now a regulatory section as to how it's calculated. So that's what that is. Um, and then the last one here is dealing with unsafe structures that unsafe structures have to be determined by the director of inspectional services. Um, that's not up to a contractor to determine that it's unsafe. So those are all the, the zoning articles that are currently underway for regular town meeting. There are apparently three proposed articles for the special town meeting that have not been published yet. Um, my understanding is one of them has to, is uh, that we have a provision in the zoning bylaw that says if you have uh, if you extend an, the existing line of a house parallel to the side lot line, that that's not, that that could be done um, by special permit. And it actually doesn't really work with the current interpretation of state law. So I believe the recommendation from the ARB is going to be to strike that section. But there, that has not yet come up for discussion at the ARB. So if you have any questions about all of these, um, the list that I showed you is available at the ARB's website. Um, they do have a hearing coming up on Monday, and they always have a public comment period at the end. So if you have co comments about any of them, you can add them then, but um, it's probably easier just to send them an email, uh, write them a letter, and let them know. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes? Can I make a quick Mr. comment? Stop. 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 More. Mr. Hanlon first. Yes. Uh, I was just going to mention that the ARB is scheduled to vote on all of this. They they don't vote on it as they go along the way the select board does, and they're planning to vote on all of it, I believe, on April 4th, and they're planning to uh, incorporate that and have it in their report to town meeting on April 6th. So that gives you an idea of what the, the time frame is to uh, uh, make your views known. Thank you. And um, town meeting starts on... April 25th, so there's some time in there. Mr. Moore? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to inform the board I was at most of those ARB meetings and I want you to know that your chair acquitted himself very well in this presentation of the article <laughs> related to, and it went so much more smoothly when Mr. Klein was presenting and the other articles. So I want you to know that he is uh, he's representing your board well. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore. It's nice when I bring forward things that are not very controversial either. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
that does help. You're right. <laughs> um, so the next item on our agenda, item number four, is discussion of meeting schedule. So the board in the way past had a schedule that we met Tuesday, the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. And then as we went through with all the 40 Bs, we got way off track and everything got sort of tossed about as we tried to meet time deadlines and such. And so I would like to get us back onto that schedule um, and restrain us to the second and fourth uh, Tuesday of the month. So I just want to make sure that there were no, no objections to, to doing that. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Hanlon. Um, I, <clears throat> one of the things that, I've, that, that I think is important for us to think about is, is trying to provide a good service to the, uh, to the public. And you, it sometimes happens that uh, while we ha have had in the past, this, the second and fourth Tuesdays have been sort of indicated as days that we would meet and we didn't meet on other days. We didn't always meet on those days because uh, sometimes you didn't have any new cases or new hearings uh, to do. Um, and at that, during that period of time, we didn't actually uh, come together and approve opinions in the way that we do now. We circulated them. And uh, so the opinions didn't necessarily need to wait for another meeting. Uh, they could be all signed off on and then sent to the, the town clerk. Um, I think that I would like to have us consider the possibility, I mean, to be sure if we have absolutely nothing to do, there's no reason to get together just to chat, although it's always fun. Um, but sometimes all we have is administrative items, but if we don't have the hearing, if we don't have a meeting, and a meeting which with all administrative items can take 20 minutes, if we don't have the meeting, then an applicant has to wait another two weeks in order to get final action on, on, uh, on, an, on an application. And I'd like to encourage us to sort of be willing to meet to do the administrative things. It doesn't take very long, uh, but it would, it, would, it, could, it, would, it would provide a material benefit to the people whose decisions, who are waiting for our decisions. Obviously, this is a lot easier when we're virtual than, <laughs> than it would be if we all had to hike over to some common place in order to spend 20 minutes doing those things. And we may have to, I think we should be thinking about ways of handling that when inevitably we go back to something that's not all, uh, that's not all virtual, but uh, at least for the time being, and I'm willing to try to hurry and write the opinions to, to get them out. Um, and it, it, it just would be better if we could do that. Yeah, I sort of, I, I do agree if we could, and, and certainly it's a lot easier to do if we're online, um, but if we, for a standard hearing, we need we need to advertise in the paper and do all that kind of stuff, and it takes a while to, to do it, but for a regular hearing, we only need to notice 48 hours in advance. Um, and so I think if we, it would be, advantageous for us to try to do that if we can, uh, even for just short, you know, if they're just short meetings, then then they're short, but at least we get we get what we need to get done. Um, and certainly if if it's a meeting where we're only doing administrative, if we want to change the time, I don't think that would be an issue necessarily either if we wanted to do it at 730 or if we wanted to start later, if there was some reason for that, we could work with that. So for now, if you can pencil in on your calendar all the, the second and fourth Tuesdays, and then we will. Um, certainly the next one, uh, April 12th, we do have stuff scheduled. Um, and then the next docket item, the number five is uh, policies and procedures. So uh, when we get into the, so for April 26th, uh, which we don't currently have anything scheduled for, I would like to have a meeting uh, where the board can sort of review the current uh, rules, rules and regulations document we have, and also the the way we handle procedures to see if there are things we would want to adjust, uh, things that we would want to improve um, going forward. And uh, the second, the sort of the last half of April is traditionally when we do our uh, annual election for positions on the board. Uh, so we have the two positions we uh, of chair and vice chair. Um, and so the, the election for that would be on that date as well. So any 
questions on those? Being none, um, for those who are town meeting members who are up for re-election this year, good luck to you. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Mills, are you are you running again? No, I'm not up for election this year. Ah, oh, you're not up. Okay, Mr. Hanlon, are you up for election this oh, year? Oh yes, <laughs> myself as well in a reformulated district. So yep. we'll, we'll have to see how this how this goes. But uh, Dan, you're not on town meeting, are you? Good fun. No, just, just this. <laughs> <laughs> Depending on where you live. I'm, I'm easing my way in, guys. <laughs> in some precincts, three write-ins and you're in. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can't encourage Roger because he's been he's in my precinct. So. <laughs> oh, shucks. <laughs> <laughs> and Venkat, I don't know if you're involved in town meeting or not. No, I haven't. Um... Always fun to see how the sausage is made. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Well, if we have nothing else, um, I guess oh, I do need to actually formally go back to agenda item number 10, which is docket 36884 44 M Road. We need to formally continue yes. that hearing. Um, so I move that we continue the special permit hearing for 44 Edmund Road uh, until a Tuesday, April 12th at 7.30 p.m. Second. Vote of the board, Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Cardelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. The chair votes aye. That one is continued. Um, and then Mr. Holly, I know you got your your laptop kicked you off. Um, we voted to continue the special permit for uh, for four to six River Street um, until April twelfth. Um, do you want to vote an affirmative on that? Yeah. Okay. Aye. Perfect. That way I can. That way, in case somebody misses next week, we can still keep you on. Sure. Uh, with that, unless anybody has anything else to discuss this evening, I think we're about ready to vote to adjourn. So I will read my last little bit of my script here. Uh, thank you all for your participation in tonight's meeting of the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals. I appreciate everyone's patience throughout the meeting, especially wish to thank uh, Rick Villarelli and Vincent Lee for their assistance in preparing for and hosting tonight's online meeting. Please note the purpose of the board's recording of the meeting is to ensure the creation of an accurate record of the proceedings. It is our understanding that the recording made by ACMI will be available on demand at acmi.tv within the coming days. If anyone has comments or recommendations, please send them via email to zba at town.arlington.ma.us. That email address is also listed on the Zoning Board of Appeals website. And to conclude tonight's meeting, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Hanlon. A second? Second. Thank you, Mr. DuPont. Vote of the board. Mr. DuPont. Aye. Mr. Hanlon. Aye. Mr. Mills. Aye. Mr. Riccadelli. Aye. Mr. Holly. Aye. And the chair votes aye. The board is adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks, guys. Bye, guys. Good, Good to see night, you all. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night.